So it is 830, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. And I'm going to say a few words, but before I do that, I was going to um, turn it over to Susan Barrett just to announce some public uh, comment periods. Susan? Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. A few announcements. Uh, first, the board is accepting public comment on the FY22 budgets, hospital budgets. They, that started on July 28th and it runs through September 1st, 2021. Uh, the schedule for the next two weeks of hearings uh, is located on our website under the hospital budget tab. And just as Excuse a reminder, me, Susan. Yep. Yes. This is it's Joanne. I'm having yes. trouble hearing you. Could you okay. speak up, please? Sure. Thank you. So, the hospital budget hearing schedule is located on our website under the hospital budget tab. As a reminder, all of our meetings for the hospital budget hearings will be held remotely. Members, staff, and hospital teams will be uh, using our Teams function and will be uh, conducting these meetings remotely. However, per open meeting law for the state of Vermont, we do have a physical location but uh, the board and the participants will be uh, participating in these meetings remotely. The board deliberations will start on September 1 and the board will vote no later than September 15th on the hospital budgets. And we do ask that you submit your public comments to our public comment portal or call um, Abigail with any comments or email her prior to September 1 so that the board uh, can consider them in their deliberations. And just as another reminder, which I uh, will I, I remind folks on every public uh, board meeting that we are uh, encouraging the general public to submit public comments on a potential next agreement between the state of Vermont and CMS on an all payer model. Any of our comments regarding that are sent, any of those comments are sent to our partners at the AHS and the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on the next model. And that is all I have to report. Um, I would, I checked in with Abigail this morning and we did not have any public comments yet uh, on the hospital budgets, but we will um, post those as they come in. And I will turn that back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. And just as a reminder, that physical location is 144 State Street in our conference room and um, staff is there and any member of the public uh, can participate uh, through the uh, physical location at 144 State. Um, with that, I just want to um, say that today is the first day of hearings for hospital budgets and um, Last week, it became very clear to the state of Vermont that um, based on projections and everything that's happening around us, that um, we could be in for a rocky road, for, especially at our hospitals over the next 21 to 30 days. And um, despite the, the great work by all Vermonters to have the highest vaccination rate in the nation, we, we are not immune from what's happening um, in the world around us. And there is an uptick in COVID cases and there is an uptick in hospitalizations. And if you model that out as the state has done, um, it, it shows that we could actually have peak hospitalizations higher than what we had last November. And um, the state of Vermont through Secretary Mike Smith has asked hospitals to ramp back up and to make sure that they, they have the COVID beds, that they have the testing, and that they have the vaccination. And this comes at a time where all hospitals are dealing with the e extreme stressors of the pent-up demand that was created by the lack of, uh, of um, willingness from people to do the prevention um, services and putting off um, some non-emergent services um, during the pandemic. So hospitals, like all businesses around this country are stressed right now. And hospitals don't have the luxury that a number of other businesses do. When you take a look at 
Some businesses have reduced hours or reduced services, things like that. Hospitals can't. They can't close their door. They're open 24-7, 365. And um, so they're dealing with this. They're dealing with this all at a time where there's a nationwide shortage of people to staff all positions in hospitals, whether it's providers, nurses, technicians, you name it. It's it's a difficult time. And um, they've done yeoman's work during these difficult times. With what Mike had asked the hospitals to do, there were some questions by hospitals about whether or not there could be any reduction in the regulatory process. And fortunately, at this point in time, most hospitals have done all the heavy lifting of the actual um, written submissions and all the, uh, the data. But the board is not unsympathetic. We would have to vote in an open public meeting like today to do anything differently. But um, fortunately, the two um, people presenting today, the two entities, the institutions of Southwest Vermont and Brattleboro Memorial chose to move ahead. And we don't know um, how others might um, wish to do something different, like maybe waive a hearing. And we'll, we're gonna be hearing from Jeff Tiemann shortly, and he may know more, um, more might have developed since our last conversations. Um, but I do think that um, the vast majority of the work has been done by the hospitals and really want to give a big um, thank you to um, the team at, at Southwest and the team at Brattleboro for moving forward today. It would have been difficult to have had a conversation about how to uh, do anything different in the process uh, on the very first day. And there just wasn't time to um, notice and call a meeting to do anything differently. So again, uh, a big thank you um, to these two hospitals today. And with that, um, if there are any questions on the board on anything that I've just said, I'll answer those. Otherwise, I'm going to, um, as we always do, um, call on Jeff Tiemann for a few words, and then I'm going to call on Mike Fisher for a few words. So um, do board members have any questions about anything I've just said? So hearing none, um, Jeff, I'll call on you first and then I'll call on Mike, Jeff Tiemann. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your, your comments. I, I agree with all of them. Um, good morning to everyone. I, I appreciate the chance, as, as Kevin said, to make some comments like I do when this process begins every year. For those who may not know, I, I am Jeff Tiemann. I'm president of the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, which represents our network of nonprofit hospitals here in Vermont. I plan to focus my comments today on a, a difficult trifecta of issues that I think um, Kevin Mullen just touched on, and those are workforce, COVID, and inflation. In the five years that I've been in this job, including the really perilous last 18 months, I have never seen hospitals so challenged. Um, in many ways, we are in the most intense part of the pandemic so far. As Kevin said, our hospitals are increasingly full. They are full of sicker people and their capacity is being further tested and stressed literally every day. We have patients who are seeking care for mental health conditions and find themselves stuck in emergency departments when they need and deserve a much better space for treatment. In terms of COVID, as Kevin said, we're back in the business of prevention and vaccination and testing. And complicating all of it is the monumental workforce challenge that creates new problems every day, new expenses every day, and has left our existing staff flat out and burned out. So given all these factors and how hospitals are really squeezed by them right now, um, as Kevin said, you may hear a couple organizations request some degree of relief from this regulatory process. I have actually not heard of any that are currently interested in doing that, Mr. Chair, but I will keep you posted on that and understand that the board will need to deliberate should that be the case. I think as you and I talked about last week, most hospitals do wanna tell their story, but as that changes, I'll keep you notified. Um, as, as you also said, uh, hospitals have, have already submitted their budgets, they've done the hard work, um, and I think they've done it with their mission in mind. I would say that now as a result is not the time 
to add to their concerns around financial stability. Um, the hospitals have submitted these budgets because they represent what's required to care for their patients, to meet the need of the community, and to continue leading us through the public health crisis as they've done so well so far. In terms of the budgets, a couple brief notes that are worth highlighting, I think. First is that Vermont hospitals charge master increases over the past three years average about 3.8%, and our revenues are growing slower than Medicare's estimate of healthcare inflation. Without other operating revenue, Vermont's hospitals would have reported a negative 6.8% operating margin versus the still thin 2.3% positive margin they collectively report now. It's also important to note in this space, hospitals' gratitude for the CARES Act funding they received last year to be stabilized. The appearance of healthy hospital balance sheets and income statements today is largely the result of federal monies, without which, without which we would have faced financial ruin and you would have seen hospitals close their doors here in Vermont and elsewhere. So with that backdrop, as you listen to these budget presentations, I ask that you appreciate the effect of a few key factors. First, that we're still very much in the middle of the pandemic. As Kevin said, case growth right now is as high as it has been, and our hospitalization projection is daunting. Um, meanwhile, the situation remains really uncertain with variants, and I'm hearing reports from my counterparts, like the one in Oregon, um, of seeing significant supply shortages on top of everything else we're managing. Second, this budget process starts long before today. Instead of building budgets based entirely on need, the Green Mountain Care Board sets parameters through its guidance, and then hospitals try to manage their budget within those limits. Then hospitals come before this board with the possibility of seeing those budgets cut even further. This process may keep costs down, but has also left hospitals with less room to respond to the crises we now face. The hospitals have tried really hard to meet the conditions of the budget guidance. If they didn't need what they're asking for, they would not be asking for it. Third, patients have delayed care during the pandemic, as Kevin also mentioned, and that has caused many to come in sicker than they would otherwise. This has led our hospitals to see significant census increases, which has further stretched staff and even increased wait time. In addition, as I alluded to before, we have been managing a mental health crisis since well before the pandemic, and it continues to require a response at all points along the continuum. Fourth, the workforce challenge we face is so urgent and so severe that it affects every other piece of our business, from the times patients wait to the procedure for a procedure to the cost of labor at all points. And last, hospitals have played a pivotal role in keeping Vermont safe and weathering the worst of the pandemic. This is a really important reminder of how hospitals are a critical part of our infrastructure and the public health apparatus that makes Vermont at the top of the list. Similarly, with the continued uncertainty that we've been talking about already today, hospitals must remain prepared. So thank you as always for your careful and thoughtful consideration of these budgets. I think we made the best progress during the pandemic by working together and understanding the situation we face collectively. I think that's still true today. That's why I appreciate the chairman's remarks. And I hope that that collaboration and partnership continues throughout these hearings and beyond. Thank you so much and good luck. Thank you, Jeff. Next, I'm going to call on the healthcare advocate, Mike Fisher. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board, and um, hospital community. Um, I, I will also echo um, much of what both Kevin said and Jeff Tiemann just said with appreciation for what it's like to be on the ground at this moment. I think we all have our own version of that, but you have a particularly different perspective of it, and, um, and I would be remiss if I didn't uh, pause and recognize that. Um, I thought it made sense for me to say a few things now instead of saying it in the context of any individual hospital's budget, uh, because, they, um, because they're really higher level statements about the process. And, um, and so it's my hope that the hospitals that are going today and the hospitals that are going through the next two weeks uh, have an opportunity on some level to hear um, what I'm saying here. So first about our question one this year, uh, reimbursement ratio relative to standard Medicare reimbursement. Again, I, there's a comment about the overall process not directed at any individual hospital. I recognize that many of you made some real efforts 
um, to answer this question. I appreciate it. Um, we've asked this question on some level for four years. Um, we've had various approaches over that time, including this year's based on the RAND approach. Yet we still feel like we're not closer to an apples to apples comparison of charges across the hospital system. This to us seems like a fairly basic need. We need to understand the base before we consider how much to raise each hospital's uh, uh, rates based on the needs in that individual hospital. Um, every year we, we hear offers of help from various entities and we appreciate that. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not here to question anyone's motive. I know how complicated the world is, but after four years, we don't feel like we're any closer to any kind of reasonable answer. Uh, so going forward, the HCA will continue to push, again, for some kind of reasonably accurate answer to this question. Uh, we know it's complicated. We know that hospitals are paid differently by Medicare, and we know that there are issues like how bad debt and free care is booked by different hospitals in different way, different ways. But I think the real statement that I want to make is that to the extent that the board members feel like this is an important question, we need your help. I don't believe that uh, we'll be before you next year with, you know, with, with a, a reasonably accurate answer to this kind of question without the board's engagement in it. And so that that's a, a direct request, really. Um, and again, I, I w we met with UVM last week. I appreciate it. P you know, members of the hospital community have have attempted have worked at answering this question. So I'm I'm not denying meaning in any way to deny that, or not um, so, uh, recognize that. Uh, next, uh, just a, a brief statement about race equity. Um, you probably noticed a pattern. I'm tending to ask a question about, or we're asking questions about race equity at every opportunity we can. Um, and I, again, I thought a, a level setting statement made sense here. Um, we believe that every institution, including the hospitals, including the board, including the HCA, is built on an environment that in, and culture that includes aspects of structural racism in its underpinnings. We may not agree exactly on how that shows up in our processes, but I hope we can all agree that that's part of the work we all have to engage in. Um, you, each hospital, we often look at, at, at different hospitals and say, well, you're huge and or while wow, you're small in comparison to each other, but we also know that you are each central organizations in your communities, uh, important uh, employers, important uh, institutions. So um, we're asking for this. We're really asking for engagement in this. Uh, we're going to continue to look for various ways to approach it and uh, and ask for your partnership in figuring out ways to address uh, uh, the issues of, of race equity that uh, I think shows up for all of us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you, you, Mark. So, um, just a, a quick uh, a layout of uh, today's agenda. Um, first, we're going to hear from um, Southwest Vermont Medical Center. Um, the board will be allowed to ask questions, as will the healthcare advocate. And um, as is true of every hospital budget hearing, the public will have a chance to comment. And so we will be calling on the public at the end of every single hearing that is conducted. So that will be your opportunity um, to offer any comments or perspective on the hearing that you just uh, um, heard. Um, so we're going to get started. Um, after Southwest Vermont, we will take a, a bio break. I know that uh, several of you have already reminded me that that's an important part of the day, and uh, we'll make sure that happens in between um, Southwestern Vermont and uh, Brattleboro. So, Tom, if you could just identify which members of your team will be speaking this morning, and I'll ask Joanne, our court reporter, to swear you in. Uh, thank you, Kevin, and thank you for your comments. You said to you know, kick off this meeting. So um, 
my name is Tom D. I'm the, um, the CEO of Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, and today we're going to provide an overview. And I'm going to ask um, Dr. Trey Dobson, who is our chief medical officer, to provide um, a, a brief summary of our COVID-19 response um, during the last year and our plan going forward. And then um, Stephen Majetic, our chief financial officer, uh, will do the um, lion's share of the 2022 budget presentation, and we will be respectful of our time limits. Thank you so much, Tom. So, Joanne, if you could swear in the three witnesses from southwestern Vermont. Sure. Would everyone raise their right hands, please? Do you swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you, God? Yes. Yes. I heard two voices. Trey, are you on? Sorry, I was on mute. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So, Tom, whenever you're ready. OK, well, again, thank you, Kevin. And thank you for the for the board for your, your, your support. Oh. If we could ask whoever is doing that to please mute themselves. Okay. If you're not speaking, everybody, it's a good policy to be on mute. And um, Tom, hopefully uh, you can okay. proceed. OK, thank you again. And um, and uh, Steve, uh, Stephen will handle the, the slide presentation. So Steve, the next slide, please. And, uh, and again, I won't go through this in any detail. But I just wanted to um, give the board a sense that um, as, um, as a small uh, rural health system, um, we focus very much on our on our vision of the system, which we, um, you know, our vision statement, as I paraphrase, is really to be re recognized as a preeminent small rural health system known for exceptional care, convenient, safe, and affordable care. And, and we take all those very much uh, to heart and it's really part of our strategic initiatives. And, and as you look at some of these accomplishments during um, the last year, um, I think it kind of highlights our, our continued effort. And this comes from our board to our leadership, to our medical staff, to each of our employees, that, um, that all these are, are critical for our, our success and, and to be uh, a community steward of our healthcare resources. And um, again, I'm not to hit all of these, but I do want to highlight a couple of key ones that were really actually were new and during the last 12 months. And um, the second one down there is, is, is the fact that the American Hospital Association named our hospital um, as, their, as their nationwide um, recipient of the Rural Hospital Leadership Award. Um, and that really focuses on the efforts that our health system did in terms of working with our community partners in terms of community health and, and our uh, efforts of uh, collaboration and, and creating community coalitions. And that's something that um, we, we think is a, a critical piece of our long term success. And, and, we, and we take it very much to heart and we're very appreciative. And the, another um, recognition that we received um, this year is from the Loan Institute. Um, and um, Loan um, ranked um, our hospital four out of over 3,200 hospitals in the country for the value of care. And uh, we received an A-plus rating there, um, highest among Vermont's and New Hampshire hospitals. And um, again, as you look at the value of care, if you look at the value of care proposition, you know, that's viewed from our perspective as, as quality over cost um, creates value. And again, this is something that we uh, try very, very hard to, um, to create a, a value proposition for our community and for um, all Vermonters. So uh, very, you know, very um, important, I think, um, recognition for the work we're doing. Of course, you know, our, we did receive our fifth magnet designation, which we were, you know, uh, you know only one out of 28 out of the, co the country, which was a tremendous accomplishment. And of course, our workforce issues. And, you, and, and that was touched upon by, um, by Jeff, as well as Kevin, Kevin's statements, that workforce is such a critical challenge. And, and, and for us to be named, uh, you know, one of the best places to work in Vermont seven straight years is critical. 
and we're and we're doing a number of initiatives to try to to try to tackle that uh, challenging problem. So if you go to the next slide, um, Steve, and and this is um, uh, a summary of our strategic plan. And I I, I, I showed this to you last year. Um, I must admit the COVID um, pandemic had slowed some of the progress we had hoped to accomplish, but still we made a, a significant accomplishments. One area that was slowed was to was to kind of complete our our organizational um, um, in, increased integration strategy with Dartmouth Hitchcock. Both institutions had to focus its time and effort on its um, COVID-19 response. So that so that got slowed, but we're hoping that will pick up again by um, in, in in 2022 when we can get to that higher level of integration, which we're which we're very very much focused as a strategic imperative for our success. But we are pursuing numerous partnerships, and the partnerships um, vary from institutional partnerships with the Dartmouth to um, service line partnerships, which we have done in terms of long-term care and some other initiatives, to community partnerships from small organizations, small not-for-profits, to bigger organizations as we try to continue to revitalize our our southwest region of the state, which. Um, has been, you know, certainly um, challenged over the at least the, the 12 years I've been at the health system. But there are some main areas just you know, very briefly. I will hit upon those, you know, as, as you look at our our advancing our, our clinical uh, services the thing, I guess I want to highlight there is that we view behavioral health as an area that needs a significant amount of um, intense and increased focus and we we had started doing that in the last year with um, a partnership with um, our our um, united counseling services um in the formation of what we call it's an urgent care for for um, adolescents or the puck program which was a pilot program and very successful and we're looking to build upon that um and we also um, developed a, a joint venture partnership in the long-term care area and that's an area of vulnerability that our Health system has had it impacts our hospital and impacts our ability to to um, um, create the, the appropriate continuum of care. Uh, we have, I think, a, a tremendous, um, very high quality system for uh, long term care. But we've been challenged financially, so we created a, an arrangement that allows a partner to come in, and we we consummated that transaction. And um, that partnership is going to, I think, help to help to make the uh, financial operations of our long-term care entity stronger, which will have an impact on our health system and we're in our hospital. So we're excited about that. Under our accelerating our operations systems there, um, again, I think the main, the key one where there was, was the strength in financially long-term care services, but also con to continue to work with Dartmouth Hitchcock in terms of expanding our, our uh, what we call our group practice, which is um, Dartmouth Hitchcock Putnam, um, and has you know, over 125 providers in that group, and 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 that's the vehicle for us to deal with the medical um, challenges of, of shortages of both primary and specialty services, and, and we've made some great strides in the last year. If there's a silver lining to our COVID experience, it was that we've saw we've seen more physicians interested, more providers. In coming to rural parts of the country, and um, so uh, Dr. Dobson, who's our chief medical officer, has led that initiative, and I, I think we're we've seen progress. Um, we, we're still challenged. Um, primary care is still one of our our biggest challenges. Um, we've made improvements, but we have more work to be done. And in the middle column, the pillar is our improving our infrastructure, and um, you know, we we appreciate the help. Um, and the questions the Degree Mountain Care Board asks us as we move forward with our modernization efforts and and certainly the, the one that we are kicking off um, in 2021 is uh, modernization of our of our emergency room and our really our, our um, ambulatory services that supports the, um, the emergency room. That's a very critical project um, and one which um, you know you you put us through some uh, a good a good set of questions and you tested us and I think we're excited about breaking ground in that project um, this fall 
and move forward in terms of a, a service which um, has been very, very busy, and especially during the, the COVID pandemic. Um, and then another thing I just want to mention in uh, under the in infrastructure is the workforce pipeline for physicians, providers, and nurses, and and we continue to try to innovate in that area. In our in our relationship with Castleton University has been tremendous. It has it has um, it has jump started our our uh, effort to to retain, recruit and retain uh, needed nurses. Um, and just recently, we became the first hospital in uh, Vermont to have an approved residency program for nurses, for new nurses. And we think that will be another vehicle to allow us to recruit and retain the, the best and brightest nurses and to help meet our community needs. So um, we're excited about that. But as you'll hear from all the hospitals uh, during these budget hearings is uh, workforce issues are real and they are a, a current um, current crisis that we're all dealing with. Um, one uh, other column I wanted to mention is, is our primary prevention and community development that continues to be one of our main strategic initiatives. And I and I and I really um, I uh, couple that with the to the columns the right, which is our population health and, and value based care. And those two initiatives are something that we are spending a tremendous amount of time in terms of trying to create initiatives that help to enhance the overall health and well-being of our of our community members in the southern Vermont region. We have hired um, or I should say promoted um, and created a new position here of director of, of population health. That individual is um, plays a key role now in working with our community agencies and, and we have formed a a community coalition of over 20 organizations that we meet on a regular basis, a couple times a uh, couple times a month, to do our planning together and to do our initiatives. And it's, um, and I think it's going to long term pay great benefits to our to our community. And we realize that um, we're more than just a hospital. We are a health system that has to focus on many aspects of care, and that that relates them both um, certainly. Um, um, issues such as food, nutrition, housing, employment, um, and we're trying to play a role in, in all of those. So we have um, we have our our plate full. Our strategic plan drives how we how we budget. Uh, we certainly in, would encourage questions to ask us about how, you know, how we're looking to allocate resources for these initiatives. But uh, the the plan drives the budget, and the budget really is our roadmap for success. And I think we've um, you know, we, we've had some we've had some success, and we certainly have further challenges to accomplish. And certainly, one of our biggest challenges and I want to hand the hand this over to to Dr. Dobson now is in trying to do all these initiatives in the midst of a pandemic, which has been a tremendous um, taxing uh, issue on our community as well as other communities in Vermont. Um, I think we've done as well as others. But uh, we know we're not out of the woods here, and I'd like to have Trey talk about our, our plans for the future. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, you can go ahead and advance the slide there, Steve. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I know people are exhausted hearing about COVID. Um, I have to wake up every morning, sort of reset and focus uh, so that uh, we can continue to uh, address the situation. Uh, early on in this pandemic, we were very fortunate just because of the team that we assembled to develop five priorities uh, to stick with. And, and these have uh, really what helped us uh, sustain our effort. First was focusing on staff and patient safety. Uh, that was paramount because that helps people move forward and reduce their anxiety. We, we also recognize that over communication and transparency uh, was much preferred. In fact, if we were thinking about something, uh, we didn't keep it within our leadership group. We discussed it uh, quickly with staff. And sometimes that can lead uh, to supposition, to people having uh, anxiety about the future, but it also built trust. And that is what was really important to make sure we were all moving in the same direction. Um, as basic as this third bullet point sounds, um, I, I don't believe uh, lots of organizations around the country uh, focused on this, and this is where they faltered. 
um, they were too busy making things very complicated without realizing that there are two things to do here, test people and vaccinate them, and everything else comes secondary. Uh, we also looked at data analytics. We built dashboards early. Our IT department jumped on this, and it really did improve outcomes. We were able to monitor PPE uh, very closely. We were able to look at uh, who's coming into the emergency department and anticipate uh, how many people would need to be admitted to the hospital. It really helped with forecasting and continues to do so today as we see this increase in testing needs. Uh, by the way, you know, our testing, just like the rest of the state, has gone up from, you know, just just a, a couple dozen tests a few weeks ago. I think we had about 150 uh, yesterday. That's a huge increase of several hundred percent. And then something that wasn't so expected, and, and again, I'm very uh, thankful that we were able to recognize this early, is being a regional resource for the community. And by that, I mean the businesses, small and large, uh, the school systems, um, the not-for-profits, even though the state did an excellent job and continues to do an excellent job at getting out information and having information available on the website, they cannot plan for every single question and, and all of these variables that come into play. And these uh, local businesses have been uh, real thankful and engaged uh, as we try to help them with their situation. So the challenges and how we responded. Um, staff safety, of course, uh, a big challenge. We really focused on PPE. You can see there, that's a little snapshot. It's a little too small to read in the right corner of the graphic, but it is showing uh, our PPE management, which we would review on a daily basis at our uh, incident command. Uh, the green shows what we have good supply in, the red shows where we need to focus our attention. Then there's the workforce anxiety, and it's it's listening, it's understanding, it's responding, and it's truly acknowledging that this anxiety uh, exists among all of us, it exists at different times, and how do we support each other through it rather than ignore it? Uh, there's the rapidly evolving guidelines and, and regulations and recommendations that uh, all of us throughout society, not just in healthcare, have to deal with, and, and then as we've seen over the past six weeks, but what we've worked uh, really hard to do is help our staff and our patients to understand these, to simplify them so that they're reliable and reproducible throughout our system. Um, there is the increasing complexity and the need to standardize because standardization is what leads to reliability and complexity, of course, is the opposite of that. And then again, engaging all of these concerns from the community frequently getting out uh, and speaking with uh, the community via social media, via uh, television uh, broadcasts, radio, podcasts we've been doing has helped uh, the community ease some of their fears and understand where we are coming from. And again, that familiarity is what really breeds the trust uh, that we need in healthcare right now when there's been some uh, doubt among the population of, of trust in, in healthcare. Some of the things that we did is we, we did not uh, close incident command. We kept incident command open for over 450 days, even when uh, the, the periods of time when the pandemic seemed to be waning or when our discussions uh, were not so involved. We continued to do it uh, and was very popular among our staff and it helped for, with communications. And in fact, we've mirrored some of our processes uh, moving forward, non-COVID related, uh, based on what we learned by having an incident command structure in place for so long. Then uh, also we had a hotline. Um, this was thought to not be uh, needed that much and it exploded early on and it continued to be used. Uh, at times we had uh, between 75 and 100 calls on average per day. Of course they wax and wane with the anxiety from the media and, and new developments in the pandemic. We developed something called a respiratory evaluation center, which was just the recognition, and many places did this, uh, but I was happy we were able to jump on this early and have the backing to do it. it. A place for people to go rather than the emergency department or their doctor's office when they needed to be seen to figure out whether or not their symptoms were related to COVID. It, um, it helped the patient themselves, and it also, of course, helped decrease transmission throughout the hospital. And again, staff anxiety, patient anxiety uh, were improved. Uh, we were one of the first uh, in the country, I really believe that firmly because we did it so fast to develop drive-through testing. Um, we got it going within 24 hours of the idea uh, formulating and we were able to do drive-through testing, which we continue uh, today. 
And then, of course, the vaccine clinic, which I'll talk about a little bit more in detail, uh, getting that together. With the drive-through testing, some of the keys were access. Access is so important. Um, I think maybe even all of us on this call have needed to get testing, or at least had a family member needed to get testing, and and the you know clinics doing the testing weren't open. Uh, now, early in the pandemic, uh, that was understandable. There was supply issues. Um, but now, really, there's no reason we shouldn't have w uh, wide uh, access to testing. Uh, you can see the days of week we were open. There happened to be another uh, resource uh, in, in our area that the state runs, but we staff that was open the opposite day. We were closed, so we were good with that. We're doing in-house PCR, which we're extremely fortunate to be able to do. Uh, we can get the results same day, and then we text those results automatically. Uh, to the patient, which helps people get back to work faster. It helps them get back to school faster, or if they're positive, it helps ensure that they are isolated. The vaccination clinic uh, is a high capacity clinic. And, you know, we were ready to do uh, 750 to 1,000 people per day. We didn't quite get to those numbers. Uh, we had high capacity uh, days of over 500. I do believe uh, we had some Saturdays for educators and other uh, specific populations where we were at that 750 level. Uh, actually, it's 1500 according to that line right there. So some uh, huge numbers going through the clinic. And we're very proud that we have between 88 91% of our healthcare workers vaccinated. That fluxes a little bit depending on uh, which day you measure it, and then over 99% of our physicians and advanced practice providers vaccinated. This regional resource need that I, I was talking about, um, there's so many questions we started receiving earlier, and, and rather than just um, pushing them towards the CDC website and the Department of Health, uh, which we did do initially, but they came right back and said, we're not getting the answers we need. So we decided to be that focus point. Um, you know, there were a few places that we actually had written down uh, relationships, agreements to help help them, but most of them were just by uh, WebEx and phone and, and video conference to help them with all their questions they have, and they still use us today. Uh, I think, that, again, that has helped build the trust that is needed between uh, a regional healthcare center and the population. Um, and it's amazing, The every day I, I get a question that just does not follow any type of CDC guideline or, or Department of Health uh, protocol because there are just too many variables in place. And working to get the answer to them, it's, it's actually rewarding, but also, again, it helps people get back to work quicker, it keeps them safer, uh, and it keeps our, our local economy running. And that may be it on slides. Oh, this is just a list of, of some of the many places that we either have formal or informal uh, relationships with to help them with their questions. Finally, I'll just kind of shift gears a little bit uh, real quick and just bring up recruiting. You can see a list here. I won't go through that list. I will say that um, primary care, of course, continues to be uh, an area of focus. We have been very successful over the past year with uh, primary care three full-time uh, physicians in family medicine and two part-time physicians in internal medicine in 2021, which is completely remarkable and so unfortunate that it is offset almost exactly by retirements um, in our area. So we look forward to continue to uh, push that. Uh, we do have some unique recruiting in anesthesia. One of those full-time physicians there uh, has been doing a pain interventional pain medicine fellowship that's sorely needed in our area uh, to help people get back to work uh, suffering from back and extremity pain uh, through interventional type of injections. And typically they have to travel very far to get those and often they just don't do that. Now we're going to be offering those locally. And I believe that's all, and I'm happy to answer questions at the uh, end of the presentation. Okay, um, now we move into the, the financial uh, performance. Um, and, um, you know, the first slide here, you'll see that um, there's four columns uh, I put in the 2019. Um, I, I left out 2020 uh, due to the pandemic and due to the high dependence, as Jeff mentioned, uh, on the provider relief funds. Uh, you'll see our 2021, our 21 budget, and then our 22 budget. Um, a couple of comments before I move off the slide. Uh, our, our 22 budget uh, shows roughly a 2% operating margin, uh, which is the operating gain. 
Um, and, um, you know, we, we built this budget uh, back uh, and we were going to call it a continued recovery budget. Um, but it seems like every budget projection that I've done since um, March of 2020, uh, as soon as I issue it and, and send it out, uh, something changes. Um, so we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing in our 22 um, uh, assumptions that we made um, as, as we go through that have changed. If I did a budget today, it would probably change. Our 21 uh, projection is uh, better than budget. We budgeted at a break even. Uh, we built that budget, uh, um, I would say, very conservatively. Uh, we weren't sure with uh, the behavior of the population, what the volumes are going to be. And as you can see, when you compare the 21 budget to the 21 projected, our net patient service revenue uh, is up uh, over 2. Point, uh, four, almost $2.4 million. Uh, in the 21 projection, we have uh, $2.8 million uh, in this projection uh, of provider relief funds, um, and we look to have an operating gain of about $4.9 million. One of the questions that the staff asked us um, uh, a couple weeks ago, um, is our projection still good? Um, and uh, we believe that uh, the projections will change. A um, couple of um, items, uh, since we did the projections, we've seen greater volumes uh, through our emergency room, through our express care um, that, that we didn't anticipate in the projection. Uh, we've also uh, are seeing expenses go up due to the volume. And uh, we also anticipate um, uh, settle settlements to come in from One Care Vermont. Uh, we've uh, been working with them to try to get the settlement in. Uh, there was no settlement recorded in the projection, so that that amount uh, uh, could be close to a million dollars. Um, and that's all on the shared savings programs uh, with Medicaid, mostly Medicaid and maybe some Medicare. Um, we're also um, working with our outside auditors to assure that we're properly classifying the use of the provider relief funds. The provider relief fund here in the projection when we did it was about $2.8 million. Um, we had deferred uh, 4.6, and uh, we are working with uh, our new auditors to assure that uh, we properly account for that. And I, I do believe the $2.8 million will increase uh, to $4.6 million. Uh, so our projection, um, you know, some significant changes um, on, the ex on the expenses. Well, we have volume. We also have some uh, expenses in order to address the workforce um, that we will be incurring over the next uh, uh, several months. Um, so overall, um, you know, when you look at the budget, uh, a 2% operating margin. Uh, we did beat our uh, budget um, and the projections, uh, a lot driven by uh, uh, the provider relief funds as well as uh, increased volumes. Uh, a big item in the red, which probably is getting everybody's attention, uh, is uh, the non operating activities in the budget is uh, a negative $49 million. Uh, that is an accounting transaction that needs to be done as we've term, uh, we are in the process of terminating our defined benefit pension plan. Um, the word termination uh, doesn't mean it goes away. Uh, it's a term that, that, that's used. Uh, basically, what we're doing is we're 99.99% we're funded. Um, and each year, uh, the administration of that pension plan costs the health system over $500,000. So what we are doing is uh, we are giving our employees options and uh, we will buy annuities and we will get it out of the administration of a pension plan. Everybody will get their benefit. Uh, so it's not that we're terminating it and the benefit goes away. Everybody will get their benefit. So this is an accounting transaction. Uh, that hits the statement of operations. Uh, there's also a, a corresponding, um, and and I, I can go on for hours on this pension accounting, and, and I won't, but uh, there's a corresponding entry uh, that will hit the changes in net assets, which does not hit the uh, statement of operations uh, for the $49 million, so it's a wash uh, on the balance sheet. 
So um, our, our net patient service revenue request um, is to go up to uh, our revenues at the time we did the budget uh, to be $177.6 million. Uh, we did not put any upside or downside risk uh, related to the One Care Vermont uh, model. Um, basically, I, 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 as I do each year, I budget the midpoint. Um, and, uh, you know, I say, I, I say no risk, no upside, no downside, and uh, uh, we, we kind of come in at break even. Um, prior to the pandemic, we had a couple of years where we were um, in Medicaid, we were on the positive side. On Medicare, we were on the negative side. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, in the budget, uh, it's basically a fee-for-service model uh, with no upside or downside risk. The increase of $10.5 million is an overall increase of 6.3%. Uh, uh, that's before the COVID adjustment. And when we look at the FY22 budget uh, and compare to the FY19 actual, the um, increase is about 2.77% a year. Uh, why do I use 19 actual? 19 actual is the last non-pandemic year. Uh, when we built this budget to um, in 22, um, we were keeping our fingers crossed, and I guess it, we didn't. It didn't work out that the pandemic uh, would would be behind us. Uh, so, um, but overall, um, the increase is 2.77 percent a year since our last non-pandemic year. Uh, when we look at the increase of our revenue, um, there's two components. One is volume, uh, and again, this is budget to budget. Uh, last year, when we did our 21 budget, uh, we were, I believe, very conservative in our volumes. Uh, and, and I know uh, we stated that numerous times. We weren't sure on the behavior uh, of, of, of the community. Uh, and as Kevin and everybody has talked about in every call I'm on, is that a lot of people deferred uh, care. And uh, we're seeing that now in 21, and we anticipated uh, some somewhat of a ramp up uh, in 22. Um, the other piece is what we get paid, um, the rate price side. And um, so each of those are roughly five uh, plus million dollars uh, for the 10 million plus uh, increase in uh, net patient service revenue. So when we look at the rate price, uh, we're looking at a charge increase uh, of 4.8%, an overall charge increase uh, that'll realize uh, $4 million or 2.4% of our net patient service revenue. Uh, we, we put an increase in for Medicare for the fee-for-service and in the fixed payment model, that's about uh, 1%, which is $576,000. Uh, uh, early returns on what's coming out of uh, on the OPPS and IPPS is that uh, that number may be a little light by a couple hundred thousand dollars, but not significant. Um, a, a risk factor in our budget is um, we used um, our run rate and we saw, if you remember, over the years, we have budgeted uh, a shift to Medicare. And this year, we did not budget that. We actually uh, 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 changed our payer mix slightly uh, back to commercial because we had seen since October to April, uh, when we did the budget, uh, we saw an increase uh, in our commercial volumes. And uh, so that was the best information we had at the time. So we budgeted uh, a shift in our payer mix. Since we did our budget, as I said earlier, some of our assumptions have changed. Um, in the months of uh, June, July, and so far in August, we have seen a, a reversal of the shift to commercial to, um, to, to Medicare. And I'll talk about that more when I get to the risks and opportunities. Um, between the DISH and the Medicaid, we put in about $41,000, and the net increase in bed debt and charity care on the rate side of the equation is about $400,000 for a change in our rate and price of over $5 million, or 3.7% of the 21 budgeted net patient service revenue. The, you know, there's always a lot of talk. Uh, we always have a lot of questions on this. The charge increase of 4.8 uh, will will increase um, about 64% of our charges. We 
through uh, all the comparative studies looking at uh, we do it each year and this year we've we've done it more with the price transparency um, we're going to increase about 64 percent of our charges uh, again our physician practice charges are not going to be increased our rehabilitation services uh, will not be increased that's PT ST OT um, uh, services and then there's select others. Uh, we have a couple of charges in our radiology department that we are not increasing because uh, we're a little um, higher than some, um, and uh, a couple other uh, other areas in the OR and other places and in the ED. This couple selected others that we're not going to increase. Um, drugs and med surge supplies is no across the board uh, increase, uh, and the $4 million is roughly 2.4% of the total uh, budget uh, for the hospital. The other items, Medicare, shift to uh, commercial, uh, our budget assumptions, uh, Medicaid, um, and as you can see, uh, that adds a, that's about a million dollars combined with the $4 million, uh, that's $5 million in rate. Um, on volumes, um, we are budgeting uh, less inpatient volumes, um, and that was based upon uh, the, at the time we did the budget. We saw our, our 21 uh, budget assumption was um, higher than we were trending. Uh, we've seen some recent turns on that. Uh, the emergency room uh, was another area where we did we saw um, lower volumes and we budgeted lower volumes. Recently, we've seen increases. Um, outpatient surgical services, uh, we've seen an increase there um, in endoscopy, um, mo mostly in orthopedics and um, uh, so we're, we're in the surg surgical services. So there's a significant increase in our volume there. Um, Medical group volumes, we're, we're making an assumption, but there's risk there uh, with the pandemic coming back and the COVID-related uh, volumes, um, and that's due to testing uh, of $900,000 we included and all the other services. So when you add up the change in volumes and services, um, we're, we're almost $5.4 million. Uh, and that's, that's comparing budget to budget. And I'm going to say this numerous times, uh, we were very conservative in our volumes last year. And uh, I was hoping that we'd, we'd be back to, and, and sometimes I don't like when I say this, I was hoping we get back to somewhat normalcy uh, pre-pandemic levels and we could we could figure out uh, what's going on. But uh, this is, again, against budget to budget last year. Um, and our budget was very conservative in volumes. Our fixed perspective payment revenues uh, are roughly $42 million. Uh, you can see the breakout, uh, and um, we, are, uh, we always reserve the right to withdraw if the corridors and the respective uh, uh, risk corridors are not acceptable. We do not anticipate um, that happening. Uh, we believe uh, I've been in contact with uh, One Care uh, Vermont, and we believe the corridors are, are acceptable to our board. So just to recap, um, revenue is going up 10.5. Uh, rate increases are approximately 3%. Uh, volume increases 2%. Uh, Three-year run rate is almost 2.8%. Uh, I think the uh, previous slides are 277. Charge increase will uh, charge master increase will go up about 4.8%. Um, volumes uh, that we've all talked about here over last year's budgeted levels. Um, and uh, uh, we still, uh, you know, the 22 volumes that we're projecting are still uh, subject to uh, behavior changes uh, uh, due to the pandemic. Okay, so we're, we're back to the statement of operations. Um, and as you can see, um, uh, you know, again, I want to stress we're at 2% operating margin. Uh, our projections will probably come in a little better, mainly driven by the provider relief funds uh, and, and, and some uh, positive net patient service revenue. From a cash flow perspective, um, here's a high level uh, cash flow uh, schedule for uh, FY22. As you can see, uh, is our operating gain. We'll have some non-operating gain depreciation expense. Uh, really what it comes to, uh, the, the bulk of this schedule is really down here. We're going to have a routine capital budget of about $6 million. 
Uh, we're anticipated in FY22 to spend uh, about $6.4 million of the over $25 million approved for the ED project. The, our foundation, which has been fundraising, uh, will do the equity contribution of $7.7 .7 million. Uh, we will be repaying about $7.2 million uh, of Medicare advances that have to be repaid without interest charges by next August. Uh, and our regular debt is uh, at 200, uh, roughly $250,000. I put in the differences here um, between the FY21 budgeted cash flows to the 21 projected, as you can see. Uh, you know, it, it's down here's a, a little different. Uh, we anticipated last year that we're going to have to go into a line of credit. Um, for $10 million, and that we were going to, uh, in 21, have to repay $8.5 million of the advances. Uh, that that didn't happen. We're only going to be uh, paying approximately $2.8 million. We had advances of uh, nearly $10 million. Uh, so so that's, the, that's the big change. And also, in order to get to that 100% funded on the pension plan, we put in uh, we're putting six million dollars in this year. We had budgeted three million, but uh, to save over five hundred thousand dollars worth of administrative costs, uh, it, it's 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 well worth it. And uh, um, so overall, uh, so so that's the comparative uh, to what we projected uh, or what we budgeted last year. Uh, a couple of other things, uh, the operating gain, as we talked about, the projection will probably go a little higher. Um, the $4.6 million is related to um, the deferred um, uh, COVID related. Uh, we had deferred some of our provider relief funds and, uh, and the capital spend you can see. Pension funding, as I talked about, and um, and the guidance, um, you know, we thought we were going to have to repay the the advances much quicker uh, than than the government's requesting, and uh, so we're 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 anticipating two eight this year instead of the eight five as we spoke about. Okay, the modernization project again. Just to repeat myself, uh, uh, the the CON had seven point seven, and the ED project spend. So when we look at our indicators, um, you know, you can see where we've been relatively, our operating margin has been, uh, you know, we target a 3% operating margin. And uh, as you can see, um, we've, we've been close to that. Our 22 budget, uh, we, we budgeted at 2%. Uh, we, we thought this was going to be a continuing uh, recovery budget. Uh, uh, 20, you know, hopefully we can get through this um, increase in the pandemic and we get back to um, somewhat um, pre-pandemic levels. But uh, uh, one of the things we're very proud of, SVMC, is lower when we compare to a lot of uh, Vermont PPS hospitals. Uh, we, we, you know, Tom talked about the value equation, high quality, low cost. Uh, there's no downside risk, uh, Medicare downside risk uh, in 20 or 21 due to the pandemic. Uh, and also in 22, we did not budget uh, for any of that. So the, just an added slide, um, you can see here, um, the actual, the black solid line is our operating margins uh, since fiscal year uh, tw uh, 12, this is 10 years. You can see our budget, uh, you know, we budget, you know, we hope pre-pandemic, we were budgeting close to that 3% a year. Uh, we believe 3% is what we need to uh, reinvest in ourselves. In 19, we, we clicked up a little bit on the budget uh, and, and we overperformed. Uh, that was some one-time transactions we knew coming in. Uh, and, um, and you can see in the 21 budget, uh, we were almost at 0% and we believe will come in. Most, like, most likely we'll end up, uh, this spot here will probably come up. And you can see the trend line. The trend line's basic. It's a slight decline, but um, basically flat. Uh, our operating indicators, uh, days cash on hand in southwestern Vermont, uh, relatively consistent. Uh, this was up due to the provider relief funds. 
Um, and we, uh, we always disclose the parent, uh, days cash on hand and, um, we will, uh, we will peak right now. And then as we go through and pay some of those, um, uh, provider relief funds down, uh, we will, we will drop our days cash on hand. Also investment returns have been positive, um, in, in a day's cash on hand, uh, days in accounts receivable continues to be below the Vermont average. Uh, and our days and counts payable close to the Vermont average. Also, some of this drop here will be uh, caused by the $7.7 million uh, funding of the modernization project uh, from the foundation. Uh, the parent does hold the foundation's cash as well. Uh, debt service coverage ratio um, is, is strong. Loan debt Long-term debt capitalization is is positive, and uh, average uh, age of plant is unfavorable, as we've talked about. Um, and and this drop from the long-term debt capitalization uh, is um, partly due to the uh, eliminating the pension liability on the balance sheet. So when we look at when we take a step back now, we, we've talked about revenues, we've talked about operating performance, we've talked a couple of balance sheet um, indicators. Uh, the operating expenses uh, will be going up uh, about uh, $6.3 million. Um, people cost in our budget are over uh, nearly 60% of our total. Uh, we have salaries and wages, uh, benefit-related costs, and then our providers through our uh, partnership with uh, Dartmouth and the PSA, the um, professional services agreement, uh, our, our, that's where all our providers uh, come in, uh, is uh, $34 million. Uh, our total is $105 million of our total uh, spend of $180 million on people. Points of interest, uh, we're, we're giving, uh, we're putting a 3% base increase in FY22. We are currently looking at that. Uh, that may need to change due to the workforce issues that we uh, uh, are all feeling in the state uh, in order to uh, keep people and recruit people. Um, and uh, we may need to make some changes to that. Um, the FY uh, FTEs are greater. Um, because uh, we've added some uh, the blueprint uh, um, FTEs in the community, um, they're reimbursed via a grant. We've increased uh, FTEs in, in clinical areas due to some staffing concerns. And uh, what we what we've been fortunate, uh, our chief nursing officer uh, has done an excellent job along with the HR department. Uh, currently, we have no contract labor budgeted, and we have no contract labor in house at this time. Uh, so we are um, keeping, you know, that's another one of those fingers crossed. Um, um, employee benefits uh, are due to increase um, over budget, uh, $7.4 million. Um, our actuary gave us a claim projections. Uh, claims are going to go up 7%. Uh, we saw a dip during the pandemic of our employees using uh, uh, their their benefits and it, they've they've now started to use them. It's, I think we're seeing it in the hospital as well. The people are, are deferred care. Um, we have uh, workers' compensation. Um, we've seen an increase there, and all the other regulatory benefits will increase. Um, and the Dartmouth PSA is increasing uh, 5.8%, mainly in uh, we've had a successful uh, year in recruiting physicians and associate providers. Um, operating expenses, um, non-salary, uh, we put it only in a 2% inflation factor. Uh, that was, remember, this budget was built in May. Uh, we weren't feeling the effects of inflation. Um, that, that is a risk to us. Uh, drug costs uh, due to increase 2.3% because we've budgeted lower volumes in some of our high-cost services, uh, mainly in the cancer center. Uh, inflationary increase uh, for drugs is 5%. Um, uh, provider tax goes up as revenue goes up and depreciation and interest increase due to, uh, we may use the interim line of credit, uh, we may not, and possibly to, to re repay some of the advances. If operations continues as, as is, we won't have to do it, but we put a little bit of extra interest expense in the budget just in case. 
a lot of numbers on this page. Uh, I'll just touch on uh, a couple of um, um, highlights in the budget. Uh, you'll see that our total assets will go from uh, the 930 2020 of 96 million uh, down to 94 million. Uh, that's that's not a negative. Uh, it's mainly driven by the cash and cash equivalents that we were carrying uh, to pay the advances down. Uh, what you will see is that um, there'll be a big decrease in liabilities. Um, uh, when you look at the other, uh, we had 12 million nine uh, down um, as of 9 30 2020, and it'll be down to $4 million. Uh, that's mainly due to the elimination of the pension liability on the, on the hospital's um, um, balance sheet. There were no service line adjustments by definition in, in FY21 or in 22's budget. Um, Trey uh, and his team, uh, we, we did fill uh, an endocrinologist and a neurologist this year, and uh, we are recruiting for another neurologist because as soon as we got a neurologist uh, on staff and an endocrinologist, uh, they, they filled up. Uh, showed the need in the community, and Trey and his team is actively recruiting for additional providers because the, the wait times are just uh, too long for our community. Risk and opportunities. Um, um, this is probably the biggest risk uh, to Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. Um, our 340B program eligibility. Um, the impact in FY22 is $2.7 million. This is significant. Um, in order to be a 340B hospital, um, Southwestern is uh, as a sole community and a rural referral center, we must maintain a disproportionate share percentage uh, of 8%. At the bottom of the schedule, you will see our percentage is 11.9, 9.2, and our interim FY21 uh, when this slide was done was 5.5%, it's down to 5.1%. Uh, when we file our Medicare cost report in February, uh, we most likely will not qualify uh, for 340B effective approximately April 1st. Um, that will uh, take out $2.7 million. Annually, we have about $5.5 million worth of benefit in, in this program. Um, currently, there's a bill in the House and the Senate that um, is working its way through uh, that, um, I'm just going to put it simply, that will not use um, pandemic year dis, dis percentage calculations uh, for eligibility in the uh, 340B program. Um, that, that, you know, when we look at the changes between 19 and 20, um, and you, if we take out the uh, high uh, inpatient um, cases for COVID, um, our percentage would have went up. Uh, when we look at 21, uh, when we take the COVID-related Medicare patients and other patients out, the high length of stay, uh, it doesn't get us there. And um, uh, one of the things that is also contributing to this is the excellent work of the blueprint and other um, providers in the community to keep Medicaid uh, patients uh, out of the hospital um, for unnecessary care or, or hopefully um, keeping them well in the community. Um, so we're working on initiatives. Uh, currently, we did not uh, budget this. Uh, this is our biggest risk. We'll be working on plans to deal with this if the legislation doesn't move through. Tom, would you like to add anything to the 340B eligibility uh, slide? Not hearing anything? I'll move on. Um, patient volumes. Um, what will happen uh, post pandemic, uh, as you can see our volumes, you see the 21 um, projected was at uh, 24 when we did this projection at 2400. Um, our budget uh, uh, was more than that. Our FY22 budget is more. Will the budget uh, uh, 
numbers hold, our, our recent trends, we probably would budget a little more if we did the budget today for 22. Um, but, um, um, you know, that's not the case. Uh, so we, we see that we'll be less than 19, um, but more than uh, what we budgeted last year. So we have an upside. If we, if we get back um, up, uh, we have an opportunity for about a million two. If we go back uh, to the 21 levels or the 20 levels, we also have a risk in the budget of $1.2 million. Nice round number. Hey, um, hey, yes, see, go ahead, Tom. I apologize. I have some sure. trouble with my mute button. Just one comment. We are meeting today um, down here in Bennington with Senator uh, Patrick Leahy. He's coming to our hospital. And this is a central piece of our discussion with him is um, with this 340B issue for for rural for it doesn't affect all the hospitals across the country. There's probably about between two to four hundred of them that are impacted, and um, we want him to be clearly aware of the impact it would have to our institution, which is significant. Thank you. Okay, our our medical group um, we've recruited and we filled a lot of. Um, vacancies but as Trey said some we've had some retirements um, and uh, so we if, if we if we based upon the three three year pen, uh, pre pandemic trend uh, if we don't hit our targets um, we, we have risk of about 700,000 but uh, with the increased FTEs we think we can uh, we may be able to exceed as as patients start um, being seen, the endocrinologist, the neurologist, and, and, and they're budgeted here, but uh, we're hoping that we can uh, open up uh, additional access. Uh, the medical group uh, in the hospital represents about 16% of our net patient service revenue. Um, and we're also in the process of instituting a new compensation model to move uh, away from just total volume and moving to uh, volume quality indicators um, and uh, our providers are very engaged to date. Emergency room uh, volumes, uh, we've seen a recent up click in them. Um, I don't wanna say we're back to normal, but we're, we're summer months have always been busy here at Southwestern Vermont in the ED and we, we're hitting uh, the historical numbers. As you can see, 2020, we took a big dip. Um, we budgeted less. Uh, when we did the projection, uh, we built our budget. We were at 19.4, which was a significant drop, but we've seen some of that volume come back. So the FY22 budget, uh, we had it at 20,007 uh, uh, looking to get back. So we have an opportunity. If we get back all the way back to the pre-pandemic, we have an opportunity of zero to $2.7 million, depending on how far we come back in revenues. Commercial volumes, as I said earlier, um, uh, we're seeing a shift um, away from this assumption. Uh, for every 1%, uh, it's, it's a loss of $600,000. Um, there has been some uh, discussion in the community that uh, a, lot of, a lot of younger people have moved into the uh, market, but uh, uh, we're not seeing that in our payer mix shift. Uh, uh, and uh, so for every 1%, it's at least $600,000. Uh, it could be even more. Um, we're seeing uh, in, in the midst of the pandemic, we're now also, and we're seeing all the uh, uh, volume starting to come back. We're seeing increased denials and third party payer audits. Um, and um, we, we, we budgeted a slight amount in there, but uh, we, we, th there could be risk between two hundred fifty and five hundred thousand dollars. And this is uh, de uh, denial, pre-authorization denials. This is denials uh, on retroactive audit claims. Uh, they go through and they say we're not going to pay for this. And, and we we battle with. Um, Last year, uh, we, we probably had uh, initial takebacks of, of nearly a million dollars, and through uh, discussions, providing additional documentation, um, discussions with providers, we were able to overturn about half of them. Um, but um, the, we, we're seeing an increase um, denials and third-party payer uh, retroactive uh, on, on services that are already rendered. So um, uh, there is a significant risk uh, to our budget this year. Um, 
So we talked about volume since budget completion, ED, inpatient, express care is up, cancer center volumes down. Uh, Medicare, uh, we budgeted 51%, and July, uh, the payer mix for Medicare was 55%. So you can see a big jump um, since we completed the budget. Um, other risks, um, the top of the list is COVID. Um, other regulatory rate increases, Medicare, IPPS have not been totally approved. Uh, uh, retention of providers, we've, we, we believe there's a lot of opportunity there, but uh, the, uh, there are members of the medical staff that are aging uh, and, and could retire and create some voids. Uh, the volumes and payer mix and the political climate. So, um, so, and I can go on talking about risks and opportunities probably for another half hour. Uh, capital spend will be six million. Uh, we'll spend six four on the emergency room in 22, then 23 and 24. We'll complete it. Um, here's the um, ED project was 25 eight. Act 250. Uh, we um, we're waiting for Act 250 to approve the start of the project. Uh, we're anticipating getting that shortly. Uh, we'll be submitting a CON uh, for a cancer center. And then we have some imaging services upgrades, CT, MRI, and possibly a family medicine residency and health center. Um, so that's the end of the detailed presentation. Let me un, un share. Thank you, Steve, very much. And uh, as always, uh, the team from Southwestern Vermont has done a a great job presenting the information to us. And as we did last year, I'm going to uh, go in alphabetical order with the board members and rotate that alphabetical order. So for this uh, hearing, Jessica will start, but for the next one, it will be um, Robin and so on and so forth. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica Holmes for questions. Great, okay, well, thank you very, very much. Really helpful uh, presentation. And again, as we say, we said last year, thank you for all the hard work, you know, the hospital has done in the midst of this pandemic. Obviously, uh, we really count on you all and we appreciate how you came through um, and all the innovations that, you know, you undertook. So Steve, let me, I'm trying to, and I was trying to take copious notes here as you were going through your presentation because I'm trying to understand where we are now, and I know it's really hard, you know, to figure out based on what you submitted in July with where you are now in this world that's changing. So I totally appreciate that this is like a, you know, constantly moving targets. But I'm just wondering, there seems to be a lot of movement, um, you know, in the projections for, first of all, 2021, um, you know, in terms of the 169, you know, potentially having you know greater volumes on ed greater volumes on inpatient things like that so i'm just wondering is there do you have in your internal calculations a new operating margin and total margin estimate for where you think as of now you're going to end 2021 so um i was working on that last night figuring i get that question uh and it's the first question i get so um the net <laughs> okay. patient service revenues probably will end up at 171.5 or so okay um the um the covid19 funding um uh, and i have new auditors and we had a discussion uh about this uh, uh that the recognition of the provider relief funds will go up um uh, most is likely that point five uh, instead of the instead of the 2.8 uh that will go up but uh keep in mind that those provider relief funds i have to justify and uh either through you know we, we purchased uh, and we built and we you know negative pressure in, in in rooms and and ed so we spent those items on capital this year and uh we spent them uh on on the covid um a vaccine clinic on uh, testing uh so all of that is built in um so um you know I, I really like i would really like if the accountants would allow me just to take the provider relief funds out of off the table okay especially the capital portion but they uh, the new auditors have and we're having discussions with them about the recognition of that other revenues most likely will be lower 
um, due to um, just a, a couple of small things, not that much lower, but lower, uh, mainly in the 340B arena. Uh, because there's less manufacturers and and, just, um, and drugs that go through that program now, because uh, they're all with they're pulling that down, and then the operating expenses will likely go up uh, for a couple of reasons. One is uh, we we will be uh, providing uh, some additional um, compensation uh, to address uh, the need to recruit, um, and uh, we have a couple of programs um, that that we're putting in place. Um, to also uh, address that. Uh, also, we have uh, started, now the state is funding part of it, but we have a, a COVID resource center that we remobilized. Uh, and Trey talked about it a little bit um, up at the, uh, uh, the college. We now uh, moved um, our COVID testing and vaccine clinic back up there due to the volumes. So that is gonna create a drain on, 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 on services. And um, so, so at the end of the day, the operating gain probably will be closer to $6 million. And mainly the driver there is going to be um, the provider relief funds uh, and, um, and some of the additional volumes that we have seen. And but now- Okay, sorry, in the total margin. So up in terms of a margin both for both operating and total, what does so that get you? So that that six million dollars would be six million. Uh, six million would probably get us to let me let me do it real quick since I'm able to do it. Uh, my, uh, it will get us to about a three point three three point five percent operating margin with with of that operating margins call it uh divided by one uh what about two what about two percent of that being driven by the provider relief funds okay okay so if you back out the provider relief funds uh we would probably be at one call it one one and a half okay um so then let me actually just jump then to uh, the projections for 2022. Obviously, as you know, the world is changing. This is obviously still going to be uncertain. But I'm actually wondering, you know, if you go to that summary of the NPSR request where you start with the 21 budget at 167 million, yep. and then you break down both the price and the volume components of that to get to the 177 million. I'm, this is what I want to talk a little bit about. And I recognize budget to budget is problematic for lots of reasons, but if, you know, since that's where we're starting from, um, I was trying to listen to your, um, you know, quick calculations there around what the impact could be if you were to update your budget request now for the potential increases in ED volume, potential increases in inpatient volume, um, if they had returned to the 2019 levels. So am I right that your volume, you know, where you had a $2 million budget to budget decline in inpatient volumes and a $1 million budget to budget decline in ED volume, can you just speak again to what that would be if you returned to the 2019 uh, volumes? What would be the, the, the high end on just the, you know, uh, on the volume component of your budget to budget calculation? Well, on the volume side, uh, I would say if we got back to 2019, uh, close to that 2 million 055 would probably go away. Okay. okay. Um, the emergency room uh, volumes coming back up, the million dollars would go away, the negative. But we got to keep one thing in mind, though, Jessica, is that we've budgeted our ED for lower volume. So I'm going to have to then increase staff. Oh, no, I understand that the, there's going to be operating expenses that are going to come with it. I'm just trying yeah. to figure out what what is the, the NPR increase potentially if the volumes that you're starting to see coming back actually continue, right? So, yep. you know, that, that $3 million would be up higher, $3 million in, Correct. in NPR. Right? I, I think that's that's a safe assumption at this point. Okay. But but like, like I, you know, Doing this over 30 years, doing budgets, um, I haven't had one projection since March of 2020 that has come in. Okay, and as soon as I think the glass is half full, 
I go back to the half empty and vice versa and vice versa. So uh, yeah. we're still in this m movement. Uh, I, I, that, I understand that. I'm just, you know, I'm trying to figure out what's the updated projections for next year, given what you're seeing now. So, you know, what would, what would it look like? Um, I also noticed that the providers that you're recruiting for weren't factored into the budget. So, um, the, well, what our assumption for providers is that if we had a signed agreement, okay, in uh, when we did the budget. Now, some of these providers, and and Trey may, you know, if if I don't get this right, Trey, tell me. Uh, it's not like when we hire a nurse that they give four weeks' notice at their at their hospital and then they they come here. Some of these providers won't come for several months, if not even a year. Am I correct, Trey? Yeah, it's in fact, it's the times increase. So we used to say at the short term, 120 days, uh, but now short term is 180 days, and it's it's more like a, a nine months to a year. So, so Jessica, the ones that we budgeted uh, as increases and increased their volumes are ones that we have we had signed agreements with, and we know their start date. Okay, okay. if if Trey hits a home run. And every one of those that he's recruiting for signs today, the likelihood of them joining us wouldn't be till mid year or even next summer in some cases. So, you know, that's just to, to put any volume on them. OK, we didn't put any cost on them either. So to Got put it. any volume on them uh, would be would add significant risk to the budget. OK, that's helpful. Um, on the price side. Uh, there was a reference in the narrative that management removed enhanced reimbursements for COVID-19 Medicare patients. And I'm wondering if somebody could talk a little bit about that and whether that's still an appropriate so, assumption. So um, when we prepared the um, the budget, we we took out the extra, va extra 20 percent that we were getting on our COVID inpatients. So we took out the enhanced reimbursement. On, on those cases. That's, you know, is that going to continue? Well, I think it will now. Okay, sitting here in August, when we built the revenue budget, which was early May, you know, I, maybe we were a little too optimistic, but we were thinking that at some point uh, the public health emergency would be off and the COVID patient uh, enhanced reimbursement would go away. So, yeah, I wish um, you had been right. But given what we're seeing with Delta and, you know, what we're hearing, I'm just wondering what what impact does that price piece have then on your projections now? Is well, it, it, it probably would be, you know, let's call it a half a million dollars. Okay, okay and, that, and that might be high. Okay, I'm just trying to get a, a yeah. sense of these. Yeah, and then there was another mention. Uh, you know, you'd mentioned there was a one percent increase for Medicare, uh, but in the narrative, they're talked about uh, a possibility of a four to five percent increase for fixed prospective payment from One Care Vermont. So I'm wondering yeah. that was back from the narrative. Is the one percent assumption still accurate, or is it closer? Is there, you know, what? Can you talk a little bit more about the four to five percent? Well, I, I, I was on um, uh, a call uh, with um, uh, One Care um, earlier in May, where there was a uh, Medicare. There was a discussion about Medicare, uh, saying that in models such as One Care, that there could be upwards to five percent increase. Okay, um, I put it in there to put a little pressure on everybody uh, to say, hey, listen, you know, we got to go for everything we can get. Um, but that was pie in the sky stuff. Okay. That was just to raise the factor that, that currently, uh, I'm not sure we're capitalizing and I'm, I'm not sure who's responsible on all of the opportunities. I think it's a combination between one care, Green Mountain Care Board and the federal government and the negotiations, uh, uh, of the plan, uh, that, that we need to get every dime we can get um out of the medicare program because yeah, the fee for service program is only one point something percent when you look at all the ins and outs of 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 it and uh, on the outpatient side i haven't uh, uh thoroughly studied it yet and uh but um so 
So if there, if we can get to hypothetically a four percent increase through the one care model, okay, um, that that would help. Okay, okay. but we, we haven't been getting uh, that uh, over the years. So, got it. And then okay. that and then and then that comes into the assumption where I budget. I always budget the fee for service, which is the middle of the road. Okay, I don't budget upside or downside. Okay, so so that that would help that assumption. Got it. Okay, so that's helpful. Wanted to know what that was referencing and what you meant by that. Yeah. Um, so let me just ask a couple more questions. Uh, actually, on volume, and maybe this is for um, Dr. Dobson. Uh, you know, so I've we've highlighted areas where volume might be even higher than anticipated in the coming budget. Um, but I also want to just reference last week Mathematica came in and they provided us with a hospital by hospital analysis of preventable utilization in focusing only on the Medicare fee for service population. And the analysis estimated that about 30% of Southwest inpatient and ED Medicare fee for service revenue is potentially avoidable. So I absolutely believe all of your team when you talk about, you know, the emphasis on population health, you're one of the hospitals that are leading in payment reform efforts. But if the analysis is right, then the current business model is relying on a significant amount of revenue that's coming from avoidable utilization. So how should we as board members think about the volume request, the NPR request in light of the possibility that, you know, some of this volume, a lot of this volume is, is potentially avoidable. So how do we think about that? Well, of course, I haven't seen the report, Jessica. Um, I have seen many reports. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be crass here, but if you can show me the patients that don't need to be admitted to the hospital, I'm happy not to admit them to the hospital. Um, unfortunately, that's not how efficiencies are gained. It's over time and it's over regional practice in order to create that standard process. Look, we don't have the resources or time or nursing staff to admit patients to the hospital that don't need to be admitted to the hospital. And I think you're going to hear that echoed everywhere. Um, there are patients that wind up in our hospital that could be in a skilled nursing facility. Uh, unfortunately, we can't get them there. I probably that's probably the biggest uh, area that could be, you know, improved. Uh, but, um, you know, I know there are stories and there are places in the country where patients come in and, and get admitted. But, you know, just using ICD-10 codes to decide who should come into the hospital, you know, it's almost um, it's almost difficult to hear as a physician or a nurse taking care of these patients that, you know, they don't need to be there. No, I think that's not what the analysis actually showed. I mean, the analysis showed that the, many of the patients need to be in there at the time that they're admitted. But the question is, could the care have been delivered earlier in a different setting that would have prevented that admission, right? So, you know, the diabetic that's having an episode needs to be seen absolutely right away. But had that diabetes been managed earlier in the, you know, might not have ended up there. So it's not it's not a, a, a metric that's suggesting that the patients that are admitted, you know, shouldn't be admitted at that time. It's really thinking about the population health and yeah. the preventative care that could be happening in the community that could reduce those admissions. So I don't want to mischaracterize the analysis and I'm happy to share it with you. Um, but I just wanted to have that conversation as you all are leaders in thinking about population health and, and, and relationships with community partners in reducing these types of admissions, we're still seeing, at least by this estimate in the Medicare population, a significant portion of revenue on that. So I wanted right, to hear right. thinking going forward, what do we do about it? How do we right. think about it? So I think it goes back to um, Tom's initial slide there that had those pillars that unfortunately we really were, um, we were making some great progress and COVID did push some of those back. But there's many examples. Um, I'm sure one of them could be, for example, wound care. So when an office uh, or an organization tries to do wound care for diabetes um, and, and other chronic illness, it typically is a, um, is a loss, you know, revenue wise, but it's a gain system wise. And so it's making those types of, of investments, yeah, doing wound care in a way that um, says we're doing this, we're putting money in now, but it's going to save money in the end. And as far as the answer to that, I think everyone, fortunately, in this part of, of the uh, country is wanting to do this, willing to do this, and we are moving forward. 
and we'll just have to keep at it um, and work together as hospitals, you know, not not in a competitive way, which we don't, but work together among all the hospitals and in meeting on that. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, you know, Jessica, Jessica, a real life example, um, working on it right now, and hopefully we go up to the state within the next month with our presentation, but we have, you know, three, four, five, six um, adolescent kids sometimes being held in our ED because there's nowhere for them to go. So we're about to create, make a presentation to create an intensive outpatient um, center in partnership with UCS that we're going to hopefully divert those kids to that center outside the hospital and, and, and have care provided from 8 o'clock to, to 4 o'clock every day for a period of time. And I think that's going to be an alternative, which would be much cheaper and, and better outcome, better care for the children. You know, that's just one example. There's a number of things we're working on right now. Yeah, no, that's helpful and that's fantastic. You're all very innovative in these ways. So. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the inflation worksheet that you all submitted. Um, and this is a part of an appendix. It wasn't presented here, but it is in an appendix. And it looked like in that breakdown, um, there was a 3% wage increase for non-medical staff. There looked like there were no raises for medical staff. Um, and that non-medical staff was about 30% of the operating expenses. As you mentioned, there was 5% for drug price increases, which is a pretty small part of the budget, about 8% of the budget, but a significant price inflation there. And about, as you mentioned, 2% for supplies um, and some for employee benefits going up. So overall with the weighting, it suggests about a 1.5% inflationary factor. And you're asking for a 4.8% change in charge. So a point and a half of that is you know, explained by inflation. How would you think about the breakdown of the rest of that 4.8% change in charge? Oh, five percent explained by inflation. So, you know, again, it's it, we're doing budget to budget comparisons. OK, last year's budget was we squeezed that budget a lot. OK, um, and also, you know, we've added we've added some resources. Uh, we, we have a respiratory evaluation unit that is uh, in our budget. We've added 17 FTEs. A portion of them are, are blueprint, but a portion of them are not. We've also uh, added some other measures. Uh, we have greeters in the front of the building for COVID. Um, and we have a, a lot of other COVID protocols that, that we now are doing. Okay. And I think will become part of the way we do business moving forward. So, um, you know, all of, we have addition, you know, just like we talked about volume. We have additional volumes and additional costs uh, inc being incurred um, that is not inflationary. So, um, you know, Annette, it, 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 we believe we have a significant risk uh, when it comes to inflation this year. Today, when we did the budget, we were just trying to squeeze everything and we said, we'll take that risk on. OK, but it's getting if, if inflation ends up coming in, you know, and the economists, you know, they go on Monday, they say they say it's going up five percent, six percent. On Tuesday, they say it's going up three percent. They say it's coming back. Um, well, we'll see. Uh, but right now, um, you know, it, we have more volume, more things we're doing. OK, well, one of the ways I think about the, the change in charge is it's got to cover inflation. Right, so yep. it's 1.5 or possibly higher than that. Uh, it's probably got to cover a cost shift because the public payers are not, you know, increasing Correct. the reimbursements at the same rate as inflation. And then it's got to cover a contribution to margin or it's got to cover, you know, somewhat of a margin. So I'm trying to ask you, I guess, in some sense to think about that 4.8%, we've got 1.5%, you know, explained by inflation. Is there a component of that that's reflecting the cost shift we actually have, you know, one of the statutory mandates is that we have to consider the extent to which costs incurred by the hospital in connection with services provided to Medicaid beneficiaries are actually being charged to non-Medicaid beneficiaries. So effectively to quantify the cost shift. So I'm trying to figure out how you Just, might think about that with that. Jessica, so here's how I look at that. The yep. charge increase of 4.8% is a charge increase. Yep. Okay, I don't get paid for that. The yeah. increase, the impact of the charge increase is 2.4 percent okay. of the net patient service revenue. Okay, it's about half. 
of, okay. the, of the actual charge increase. So, um, you know, that, that closes that gap down quite a bit. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, effective, effective rate increase is really 2.4. Yes. Okay. Yes. On net patient service revenue. Yeah. Cause remember, remember, you know, if you, if you look at, if you look at our business, um, 50, you know, in July, 55% of our charges are Medicare. Medicare doesn't care about my charges. Okay. You know, uh, when I did the budget, Medicare was only 51%. So all of a sudden now that charge increase of 4.8%, the 4 million 033 that, that, that I, uh, we calculated is going to be less moving forward. If Medicare, if we flip back to where we were going with more Medicare. So, so that 4.8, you know, if I did the budget today and the vo let's say the volume stayed the same, that, it, that charge increase, I'd be asking for maybe 5.5. Okay, um, because I now have more Medicare coming in what I know today than what I knew back when we did the budget in, in last week in May in, in June. And we held off. I held off as long as I could to, to get the best information uh, to, to, to finalize the budget. There was a lot of moving parts. Okay. So Very just helpful. an interjection from the presiding officer that um, – we have allocated so much time to each of these hearings. It's clear we're going to go over um, time on this one. The hospital SVMC did a good job of staying within their time limits. Yeah, and, okay. Um, I'm done, Kevin. So that's my last question. <laughs> Thank you for the Thank you, Jess. song. <laughs> Robin Lunge. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's nice to see you both. Thank you for um, your presentation today. Uh, I just had a couple questions um, to make sure that I'm understanding the staffing dynamics a little better. Um, so uh, you've mentioned um, a couple of times that some of the FTEs, the 17 FTEs is related to the blueprint. And what I was curious about are these new blueprint FTEs, are they shifting from another organization into SVMC? Could you just give me a little more information about those? So those FTEs are, a community uh, workers uh, that is reimbursed uh, and in and it's reimbursed in other operating revenues, and I believe it's Jim Roy. You're on the call, correct? Do you do you know that that exact number of blueprint FTEs that were transferred in? We actually transferred in um, those FTEs a year ago from another organization, and then there's an additional. I want to say there's an additional eight. Jim, so do you before, have that number? Before Jim answers, if the court reporter could swear Jim in. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, please raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Thank you. Okay, so so Steve, the question is on the blueprint. Um, yeah. The increase in FTEs on uh, just uh, Robin, can we um, Jim will look it up as uh, that's the nice thing. That's about teams. fine. Uh, yeah, that, if that's easiest. What, that's fine. I, what it sounds like there it's existing people. If you're just shifting. They're being shifted yes. into SBMC from other community organizations. Yes. Yes. OK, I great. I believe, I, I believe the number is eight, but Jim will get you the right the, the number. Perfect. Um, great, thank you. Um, and then you, when you were talking about uh, some of the other FTEs, increasing them in clinical areas due to staffing concerns, is that burnout related, retirement related? I was just curious about what some of the whys. All the above. Okay, yeah. You know, um, and we also haven't, you know, we're having a difficult time in like radiology as an example. Uh, we have people working overtime because we can't recruit positions. Mm -hmm. uh, so we budget, we budget the full, full time position, but, uh, um, but it's vacant. And so, you know, we're going to run a little overtime. We're going to flex shifts and things like that. So. Uh, um, Great. Thank you. Um, that actually was my only question. Well, thank so you. I'll, I'll catch us up on, on some time, Kevin. Thank you so much, Robin. Next, I'm going to turn to uh, Tom Pelham. Tom? 
Well, again, thank you for uh, a great presentation. Um, I will be reasonably brief here. Um, I have one kind of uh, quick question for Steve. Did I see him lean forward uh, to his desk uh, to answer one of Jess's questions and then hear an old tape calculator? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Unbelievable. Okay, how's that? How's uh, that? Unbelievable. Well, it reminds me of working with Jim Reardon, who unfortunately has passed away, but he was a, a state's finance commissioner after I left. And and I, in all the years I worked with him, I never knew that he didn't know how to use, back then it was a Lotus or whatever the spreadsheet was that we were using. He didn't know how to do it. And um, and then finally I learned that, uh, uh, actually I have to say, it just gives me comfort that that's what you're using because it's a much more direct en engagement, you know. Uh, so I, um, uh, uh, I don't have a lot here. I, I want to kind of go quickly go through and, and make an observation that I went back and took the income statement and just trended it, everything from 2019 actuals through 22, uh, 2022 budget, just to kind of see what the context was for your presentation this year, because your numbers are a little, little elevated um, relative to past years. And so, you know, on your NPR FPP, uh, the trend over the, uh, that period is, is inclusive of 2022B um, is, I, I calculated at 2.53%. Um, which is well within the margins that we talk about. Your operating expenses, similarly, even though you're looking for 4.8 percent 2022B over 2021P, the trend here over those few years is 2.76 percent, um, and your operating margins are very healthy. And but for the pension issue, you know you, you'd be in the two percent range. Um, uh, so you know I, I'm just feeling comfortable that the context here is is um, um, a very good one. All of your requests, uh, approved requests for charges, um, even though it's 4.8% this year, your prior one was 3% in 2019, 2.8% in 2020, and 3.5% uh, um, in 2021, all below the weighted average for all the hospitals in Vermont. So um, that, just gives, that just gives me some comfort. One area that, um, I, I, I saw some concern is that then if you go to payer mix and trend payer mix uh, by payer type from 2019 through 2022 20, uh, budget, Medicare trends forward, um, trends over that period at one half of 1% growth rate, Medicaid at a negative 1.03% uh, growth rate, and commercial at a 5.41% um uh, growth rate so i'm just wondering if 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 that is a concern of you that the long-term trends here are that the public payers are um uh, uh you you know that the cost shift is getting wor worse that the public payers are are down in the one percent or less range as a as a trended growth rate and it all falls to the commercial payers well, well tom you know um, if you're using the 22 budget as your endpoint on the commercials, uh, we did increase uh, the number of uh, commercial um, cases in our budget, which we're now seeing may have been a bad assumption. Uh, so, um, so yeah, th th there was an up upwards in commercial volume, uh, and which would then drive commercial net patient service revenue up in the 22 budget, but. If I had to do it all over again, where I was sitting in May, I probably would have not budgeted that. Okay, mm -hmm. but everything I was seeing at the time and my staff, uh, we were seeing more commercial, and we were like, okay, you know, when, you know, I said at one of our leadership meetings uh, just a couple weeks ago, I, I think the Medicare patients are now coming to get their care, and they were slower, even even though they were vaccinated earlier. Uh, they were slower to come back and get their care, and the commercials um, uh, patients came back sooner. Okay, and um, so we, you know, probably not a great assumption, you know, looking back, but that's what budgets are. 
you know, um, and uh, we probably should have rolled that back a little bit. Uh, it would have uh, it put an additional um, burden on the uh, overall budget. But, you know, like I said uh, earlier, and I'll say it again, uh, every time I put something on paper, it seems like it changes tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, been there, so, done that. That's, that's why yeah. I kind of went back to the 2019 trend to 22, yeah. because it's just a, a longer period of time. Yeah. Um, so in your narrative, um, I, I'll, I'll just read you the sentence. You don't need to go to the page, but it's on page 9-17. Uh, and the sentence is, um, additionally, insurance plans are requiring patients to go to specialty pharmacies to obtain their ph pharmaceuticals, with, which reduces CVMC's uh, 340B program benefits and, and that uh, uh, present ser service revenue. And I'm just wondering, so is that is should I read in it, into this that insurance plans means Blue Cross Blue Shield, MVP, and Cigna? Um, yes, to all three. Uh, United Healthcare. Um, you know, th those are our biggest uh, MVP, Blue Cross, United Healthcare, Aetna, Cigna uh, are our biggest payers, and. Uh, uh, so as an example of what that sentence was, um, they are now um, making patients go get the drugs, okay, and have them, and the patient literally doesn't bring them in. They ship them to us, okay, and, and then we administer them. So all we do is get the administration fee uh, on those drugs. We don't get the revenue and we don't incur the expense. Okay, um, and I, I guess that would um, be a similar question for one of your answers, I think, to um, Jess. Uh, oh, I lost my note here. I lost my note here. Well, let, um, so going back to last year's presentation, you presented uh, that down in the center of Bennington at Putnam Square. I don't, I, I, um, that there was a redevelopment project going there that you were going to put in an emerge a uh, a you know a, a, a kind of a satellite of the hospital into that project. Is that still on track? Um, you know, Tom, it's the, the the second phase of the project, and that would be the second phase, has been delayed by a year. So um, it's still on. You know, we still have a vision. Of having an urgent care center down there in, in the in the town of Bennington, but we're still, if, if we go ahead and do that, that's probably a, a, about a year to 18 months off, and then the project have to, has to get a lot of financing approval and so on. So, mm -hmm. still a vision, but not a plan, and not an activated agreed upon plan yet. Yeah. So still an apple in your eye, but nothing that has an in, in direct impact on any budget issues at this point. Yeah, no, it would not budget. It would the impact would be, you know, it would take us 18 months to face. It's you're talking about two and a half years um, out at least. Yep. So um, my last question is this: that I've uh, I've actually used uh, this Vermont Digger article uh, that that they wrote last May that um, profiled your, um, um, you know, kind of kind of engagement in, in, in addressing the issue that there's been a, and I'm quoting here, a flip from 80% inpatient and 20% outpatient in 2000 to 79% outpatient and 21% uh, inpatient in 2014. Um, and then, uh, and kind of at that point in time, uh, <clears throat> Uh, one care came along and but and I'm just reading here from the article, but as a hospital transition, one care Vermont, a company also working to switch the state's health care model to value over volume came into play. Southern Vermont Medical Center saw an optimal window for a transition. I think that was your quote. Um, and so I'm just, you know, so then I'm looking in your narrative and seeing, you know, Properly, the, the raising of a flag that that there is risk there with one care, and that if if the risk orders get too severe, um, you reserve the right not to participate. But I I guess my question is that you are the premier hospital in my mind in Vermont, and I think Jess referenced this as well. 
that has engaged um, uh, value-based uh, care. And and 24% um, of your net present service revenues uh, is a fixed prospective payment. And so I, I'm, I'm wondering uh, where you think you are in terms of your relationship with fixed prospective payments. Are you where you want to be? Do you want to uh, to to grow your share more? Do you think you're at the tipping point, which is a question that that we've asked in the budget guidelines? You know where where that relationship is driving innovation and efficiencies uh, in your system, or do you think you're at the frontier and and maybe need to pull back a little bit? Hey, can I answer the first part of that, Steve? And you jump in, but I yeah, go say, ahead. I would say, um, Tom, that we we embrace um, the movement towards value care. We know that there's a risk to it, but we have a significant amount of people who leave our region for care, and they go to Albany, and they go down to Massachusetts, and other areas, and New Hampshire. And our, and our, I think if we can capture that market and provide care locally. I think we I think that's going to be a win win for everybody. I think it's you know, I think we can provide the care at a pretty high level of quality and at a little bit of a, at a cheaper price than having those patients go to to the academic centers in, in Albany or, or down in Massachusetts. So our, our goal is to capture that business and provide that care locally. And I think if we do that, I think the overall one care model benefits and I think it benefits Vermonters and it benefits us. And that's what we're trying to shoot for. But, you know, it's still there. It's, it's a dicey road and there's a lot of challenges to it, as Steve will attest to. And, um, you know, our board keeps our feet to the fire in this one. Yeah. And and and, and Tom, um, we, you know, Tom D said it right. If 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 we can keep the patients here. OK, uh, we know we can give high quality and, and, and with high quality comes low cost or lower cost. Um, and let's take neurology and endocrinology uh, as an example. We, we didn't have a neurologist for a period of time here. So all those patients had to leave. We now have one. OK, and, and Trey and his team are working on trying to recruit another one, an endocrinologist is another example. We didn't have an endocrinologist for a while. And those patients, when they need that specialty care, if our primary care physicians couldn't handle them, uh, we'd send them to out, out. We now have somebody. So if we can pull all that volume back uh, on the things we can do, okay, uh, it's lower cost. Trey, you look like you're going to add something to that. No, I don't have anything much more to add, but it is true. It's lower cost, but it's it's, there's even lower indirect costs associated with people missing work to travel, uh, the travel itself that that really benefit from um, not even this budget discussion, but just the overall cost to Vermonters for participating in healthcare. So, 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 so Tom, right. if we if we were able to curb, let's say 25 percent of that out migration, and bring it back into SVMC. Our revenues will go up, but the, the the charge to the system, I would say it would still go up, but it wouldn't go up as much. It, it may actually go down because if something costs, I'm making a number up, $10,000 uh, in Albany or somewhere else, and we can do it for 9000 okay, uh, that's a savings to the system. But the hospital itself, we would see an increase, okay? Um, so so that's that's what we've been, you know, and, and when you look in the uh, under the hood of our strategic plan, a lot of it is keeping patients home on the things that we can do. OK, and just, Tom? and just to quantify that number, just so the group's aware, it's about 50 million dollars a year that out migrates to these other markets. And then we can't do all that 50 million. But there's certainly a, a significant portion of, of that business that could be done locally. Mm -hmm. yeah, so and, so and let Tom, me just a quick follow up. Sure. So why why is there this out migration? Um, lots of uh, trays very averse, but lots of reasons in terms of you know not having enough specialists in certain areas. 
Um, there's also, you know, for people go for, you know, the name organizations, academic centers. Um, you know, a lot of challenges in terms of, um, you know, why people would go from a rural area to more in an urban area where there's a lot more choice and a lot more physicians. Yeah, Tom just said that just right. It actually depends on the specialty you're talking about. For example, I'll tell you, cancer care is different than gastroenterology when we look at the reasons people leave. So for gastroenterology, it's all about because we don't have enough uh, supply here to meet the demand. And in cancer, we can meet the demand, but you're going to always get a certain percentage of people who want their cancer care at Dana-Farber or in Boston. And uh, we do the best we can with that. Yeah, yeah. just we to realize, remind you, Tom, that we we're, we're Tom past we're board time and we have two more board members. Yep. So yep. if everybody could uh, keep it brief. Move along. I'm done. OK, Maureen Yusufer. Maureen. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Fortunately, several of my questions have been asked, but I do have a few. Um, thank you very much for the presentation and, you know, the details specifically on the financials are very helpful. Um, just going through back to the, the, you know, where you are on the projections, um, can you talk, Jess talked a lot about, you know, ask a lot of the questions, but on the ACO reserve piece where you're actually going to get back, I think you said about a million dollars this year. Um, how is that going to flow through? How is that going to improve your bottom line, um, if at all, for for um, 21? Can you talk to that? And were you addressing that earlier when you talked yeah. about what projections would be? That 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 was included in my in my calculation, Maureen. Um, okay. That that would drop to the bottom line. Um, that that million dollars from one care. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. I. I Assuming you're going to pick up, yeah, you know, probably about 2.8 million between that million and some of the money you're going to get back from the. Yeah, but but I ha also have some. Um, I have reductions in other revenues happening, and I have uh, a a retention uh, employee retention program that I'll be accruing some expenses on. Right. Okay. So. And then, can you talk at all about? Do you, will you then have any reserves left for ACO on your balance sheet? Um, I have no reserves on my balance sheet for the ACO. In 2020, there was uh, for Medicare, there was no um, there was no risk uh, due to the public health emergency. And so far in 20 um, for fiscal year 21, uh, as long as the public health emergency goes into place, there'll be no uh, reserves okay. um, re recorded. That's what I thought. Okay. Okay. And just talking about. Uh, the pension plan um, and kind of the ongoing benefit of that. It, it seems that there was, um, I believe there's going to be about a $5 million um, cash benefit each year. Is that true that you used to fund for the pension plan? On, on, a, on a cash flow basis, yes. There's, um, th that has been a drain to get fully funded. We started on the Quest uh, many years ago. Interest rates have not um, work to our advantage but uh, when you look at the statement of cash flows um, uh, that i gave you uh, last year the, the years before we were running at about five million dollars in the 21 budget we anticipated three we're going to come in at around six and that'll put us in fully funded so they'll that won't have a negative the cash generated from operations will not have to go to the pension plan it will allow us to increase our capital purchases it will allow us to do some other things uh, related to our um, physical plant, uh, our IT systems, and things like that. So our cap, our capital budget has been a little squeezed because of the pension over the years. Yeah, but, I mean, it's your balance sheet looks pretty good, and so it's going to yeah. help obviously in the future to yeah. not have to fund that pension plan. Correct. Um, can you talk a little bit about 340B accounting and, you know, how that works on both the revenue and expense side? You know, when we talk about any adjustments or reductions in 340B, we, we always talk about the other operating revenue piece. Are there offsetting expenses in the expense piece? I mean, you know, I guess what's the net of benefit of 340B to the bottom line? So to the, to the bottom line, 340B in in um, in our budget is about 5.5 million dollars. Okay, uh, a portion of that 
is what I'll call contract revenue for, um, which is recorded in net patient service revenue. Um, and then in, on the expense side, there's two components. One is an actual operating expense. In order to realize those revenues and other operating revenues, we have to pay fee, fees out to uh, accrue uh, those, um, those revenues. And then what is also built into our expense base is we buy, we buy drugs that we administer at a lower rate than we would if we were a non-340B. So it keeps our drug cost down, okay? So uh, our drug cost, uh, if we lose 340B, what'll happen is other operating revenues will go down, drug cost will go up, and we will lose some other ex administrative expenses that we have to pay out um, for, to realize the revenue on, in other operating revenues. So overall, other operating revenues down, drug cost up, other purchase services going down a little bit. And when you have those revenues for the 340B in the revenue section, um, then there are no corresponding expenses for drugs that are being administered there as an expense. I mean, I get you get the revenue, but isn't there a cost for the drug? Yeah, there, 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 there are those costs in... in um, on the, in the operating expenses. So we'll lose those revenues and we'll lose those costs. And that's that's one component right. of 340B. Then the other component is when we purchase drugs today, we, we can purchase them at a lower rate. So our drug cost will go up. The drugs okay. that we administer, that we buy here will go up. Yeah, I'd love to see that reconciliation at least to understand you know, the revenue the revenue for the 340B, the expenses for the 340B, and then um, the other piece that you're talking about, which is just the general drugs that you administer that you'll have to pay higher costs for. Um, sure. There's always, just as always, just a little bit of mystery of, of 340B in total, and certainly it could be impacting many of the hospitals in the future. Well, um, our, the, the eligibility, though, is specifically, uh, I don't know the other hospitals if they've done the analysis, but um, we have the eligibility uh, knocking at our door. Yeah, I think and, you may and, have a different issue. I mean, some of the other hospitals are talking about right, manufacturers that are no longer participating, right. so they're right. reducing um, the 340B piece. But mm -hmm. um, all in all, it, you know, every year that's certainly a risk that comes yep. into play. Um, that could be significant um, should it should you not be able to, to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about something we didn't really talk about, which is cost saving initiatives. And, you know, what major initiatives do you have? I mean, obviously, you've gone through a lot, as all the hospitals have through COVID. But, you know, what if any efficiencies are coming out of that? Um, you know, how, how do we look forward to be able to offset some of the cost shift and other other things that are facing the hospitals, you know, versus commercial rate? So, Maureen, uh, there's currently uh, there's not we are continuing on our effort for cost savings. And one of the ways that that we do that, and I've said this before, is that our inflationary increases, okay, you know, and let's take let's take a manager. They come to my office and say, you only get budgeted me 1% increase in inflation, okay? Um, you know, it's I'm going to, it's going to cost me 5% to buy the, the, the wax for the floor. And so we sit, you know, I, I sit and I discuss it with them and the team works and uh, we build in some uh, incentives for the managers and, and we squeeze them a little bit and, and they got to find ways to save. Uh, during this COVID period, we have not focused, um, you know, a lot on individual cost savings uh, programs, but if we lose 340B, you know, we'll be putting together a, a plan. Uh, but we got to make sure that we're, we're equipped and that we have the staff and we have the supplies to, to, to treat our community during this COVID period. So currently, you know, we don't have any specifics, but I can tell you this team, 
okay? And you can benchmark us against any other hospital in Vermont, any hospital in, in New England. Uh, our cost per whatever you, measurement is, 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 is very good, okay? It's favorable to a, a, a lot of uh, benchmarks. So, um, you know, we will put something together uh, over the next several months as if the legislation goes through, we will have to cut some costs. But I do believe that some, if we lose the 340B eligibility, some of it will come off of the uh, bottom line uh, because we can't, we, can't, we can't cut to the bone. Okay. Uh, okay. It seems like I, one I, of... I would add to that <laughs> comment though, uh, we are engaged with um, an outside firm who now is looking at each of our cost centers, Maureen, and we are now doing internal benchmarks on our staffing and our other expenses to see how each department stands up to us ourselves internally, by the way, we're using, we're going back a few years ago when we think we were a little more efficient and we said, how do we get back to where we were before? And, and, and again, we are, we're always shooting for how do we get, can we get down to that, you know, 35th percentile in terms of our cost for similar size hospitals across the country. And um, we're not there yet, but that's why we want to work with this, an outside individual who will look look at every cost center and work with every director. So I think that's going to be a piece of our plan. And we are now planning to lose 340B. So we now figure out we've got to really, um, you know, press the, the, um, the metal to figure out how we're going to, you know, get around this challenge. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it does seem across many of the hospitals, one of the kind of maybe favorable outcomes and, and, and one of the things you're showing is, you know, no contract with labor. Um, you pay more to, to retain your staff, but that should be lower cost than, than getting, you know, if we're able to reduce some of the travelers. So, you know, at least it seems like people want to come to Vermont and, you know, even in your recruiting for physicians and things like that, that, you know, maybe should we look back on this, there might be some, some net benefit for for that. And that, so I, yeah, that wasn't always the case. I mean, actually, yeah. about three years ago, we had about anywhere from 10 to 15 travelers in the hospital, and we made a concerted effort to, to change that. And our, our chief nursing officer did let the charge in that. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, and just one more question. Um, Although now I can't find it in my notes what page it was on, but I, I believe you talked about a new comp model based on volume for office visits. Is that uh, yeah, that, in our risks and opportunities, um, we, we, we're rolling, uh, we're working on a new comp model that will include quality indicators into the comp model for the physicians. So, so but currently, there also a volume component now. Yeah. Maybe, yes. Currently, is that is there and currently it's it's volume driven. OK, the comp model. So we're now moving towards v volume and quality. OK, so there'll be a quality component. And I know Trey and, and Dr. Salem and a staff member and, and working with Dartmouth, um, we're, we're looking at how do we incorporate in fiscal year, in calendar year, because the physician comp model is on a calendar year model. How in calendar year 22 can we get this quality component um, built into um, to to the comp model. Okay, I mean it's obviously good to see both, but you know having a volume incentive kind of goes against potentially some things, right? Well, it, I think uh, you know, and the way I look at it, and the way uh, Drew Lehrman, my staff guy, do, do it, it's it's going to be a journey. Okay, we can't just shut volume off in the physicians. So, so we're going to be moving and put and 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 hopefully each year put a, a higher level of that quality, uh, um, a higher level of quality into the comp model. But we, you got to walk before you run, and um, and that's 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 important. So, okay. and we and we need buy-in. We need buy-in from everybody. And I think we have. I, 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 Trey, are we? Are we I'm going to say we're getting it right so far. Yeah, you know, of course, this conversation could go forever. Volume itself is is a little less risky than productivity itself. So if you have a primary care physician that can get in and see lots of different patients, that's different than measuring them by the numbers of tests they order or the things they do. Yeah. 
I, I think Kevin's getting worried, guys. I think we had to keep moving. Luckily, on. we only have two hospitals today. We have all day, Kevin. Um, but we do you. have other uh, events scheduled this afternoon related to CONs and other things. So just a reminder to everyone. <laughs> Are you finished, Maureen? I am. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So just a quick uh, couple of follow up questions. Um, Steve, uh, <coughs> on the uh, funds that uh, the relief funds uh, that you received, was there any um, fund flow to the parent or other subsidiaries? No. OK, great. And on the defined benefits, I got more confused as you went along. Um, oftentimes what you see is um, an institution like yours uh, selling to a AAA financial entity the uh, obligation and um, that whole make sure that the uh, employees are uh, held whole. You talked about offering specific annuities to different uh, employees and uh, so that confused me if you could clear that up and on the same subject if you could clear up um, if it's is it just generally accepted accounting principles that require the the hit all in one year the 45 million versus the uh, 12 million that you looked at yeah. on the uh, balance sheet so so let me uh, explain the termination uh, current and, and current plan the current plan um, has very very few options for the employee so uh, on termination, what we are doing is we are offering the, the regular monthly benefit. They can select that or they can select a lump sum payout, OK, that they can take and they can they can do whatever they want with it. They can put it in a tax deferred. They can take it and buy a new car and pay tax on it. So that gives a little more flexibility. OK, we will we will be um, uh, turning uh, the, the for the individuals that will select the monthly um benefit okay we will be uh selecting a a triple a rated insurance company to administer the plan okay so that's the termination so the responsibility goes to them along with the assets okay that, that we've been putting aside so that does that clarify what i said you know we're giving them more you know it more does that that uh that clarifies that but what about mm -hmm. the uh so the uh financial statements so um on the financial statements, so each year in the changes in net assets, um, when you do your pension accounting, you record a loss. We've been recording a loss uh, each year on, in net assets that doesn't hit the P&L, okay? It's in other changes in net assets. Generally accepted accounting principles states that the cumulative effect of booking all of those entries when you terminate needs to be brought up and put onto the statement of operations. So we've been we've been booking this in the balance sheet and and we never talk about it, okay? Cuz it's it's part of the accounting gap requirement that we book it each year uh, and now that we're terminating, it has to be brought up into the statement of operations in non-operating activities. OK, so we've been booking this 45 million for the life of the pension plan. OK, and it's a little here, a little here, and it just builds up. And when you terminate, it now has to come up into the statement of, of operations and non-operating activity. So when you look at the balance sheet, all, all that happens is the funding, you know, and, and the number there was $12 million, of which $4 million is something else, but that $8 million it will get zeroed out, okay? Um, and, and that really got zeroed out due to two things. One, the $6 million of funding and this year, and two, changes to the interest rate, okay? But on the balance sheet, you really won't see this $45 million change, okay? You, you really don't see it because it's it, it comes out of net assets, hits the statement of operations, uh, and it washes out. It, I, and I hope... I, I, I call it accounting mumbo jumbo, Kevin. Okay, um, but it's just the way that they, the the accountants. It doesn't it. affect the, our balance sheet. If you look at our net assets, um, you know, um, I'm trying to move to the balance sheet. Our net assets um, um, won't change um, significantly, you know, in total. Thanks, Steve. Okay. 
Okay. So the final question is for Trey. And Trey, um, you talked about the out migration, and I want to thank you for filling out the uh, form on the wait times and access. And we've only seen the first two uh, submissions so far, which is you and Brattleboro. But we've, I would say that as long as I've been on the board, and even prior to being on the board, we all hear stories about people not being able to get proper access to care. And that seems to have escalated um, as volumes turned back to normal and hospitals were dealing with all this pent up demand. And we're hearing um, some real horror stories about people not being able to get the proper care. And I worry about, um, you, you guys mentioned it today, you mentioned um, it's more complex care that you're seeing in the hospital. And I, I truly worry that uh, if people aren't receiving the appropriate care that um, we're gonna continue to see more expensive care. And Trey, looking at um, the different things that are on your form, um, areas like cardiology, neurology, endocrinology, dermatology, they all seem to be pretty high. And I just wanted your perspective on whether you think um, your hospital service area is getting the uh, proper delivery of care and realizing that the huge uh, obstacles that you're facing in recruitment and everything else. But Tom did say there he saw some benefit in recruiting as one possible positive thing that you might be able to find. So Trey, maybe you could address that. Right, yes, yeah, so I would say it would separate primary care and- You know, direct deposit, I'm gonna get my health and home insurance. Right? So Do you mean electronics? Again, we have someone that uh, is not up? muted that we're hearing. If you could go on mute. Trey, go ahead. Great. Yeah, so I, let me just separate real quick, uh, primary care and specialty care. I think for primary care, we're going to have to continue to recruit, but we also have to sort of revamp uh, how the care is delivered in, in a more efficient way. And we do have some thoughts on that, as do others in the state and other think tanks nationally. And then specialty care, it's a combination of recruiting people in, but of also trying to deliver that care remotely. Um, I'm not just talking about traditional telemedicine, I'm talking about some sort of combination in, in that regard so that the uh, there's the combination of being here and seeing a physician or seeing an advanced practice provider, but having some of that analysis done remotely. Uh, so to keep it brief, I would say we, we have to come at it in all different ways. We have to recruit more people here, and then we have to look at how can we deliver this uh, health care uh, in, a, in a more efficient way. And are people in the Bennington Hospital Service area receiving adequate care today? Uh, yes, overall, there are definitely some things that um, are lacking, and one unfortunately is oncology, cancer care, uh, having to travel far. And another one is gastroenterology. Although we are working hard to meet those demands, uh, meet those uh, demands, uh, people are having to travel, and some of that's acute. It's not just chronic, you know, chronic conditions. It's some acute things. So, uh, yes, they are today. Um, it's always a little tedious, and uh, we're working to make sure that we get that balanced right. Thank you, Trey. At this point, I'm going to turn the um, questions over to the Healthcare Advocates Office. And Mike, I'm not sure who's asking the questions for this hearing. I think you got me, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Southwest. Appreciate the presentation and, and your answers to the questions so far. Um, <clears throat> the uh, We sent over a few questions, uh, race equity questions in the last couple of days. You know, let me just pose pose them in one question. Uh, can you talk to us about how your budget is a um, uh, supports uh, the allocation of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, uh, projects, trainings, collaborations, and um, yeah. Well, well um, Mike, maybe I can start, and then uh, Trey and, and Steve can jump in too. But uh, certainly, I think we have. Um, um, recognizes a need more work to be done here. And I think that's the reason why we was informed at the at the health system. It, first of all, is a, a very, very large active um, diversity and inclusion committee made up of physicians, staff people, nurses. I think the group now is about 45 people who are made up. And um, part of that was uh, 
based on a presentation that went to our board in terms of some of the challenges in our region. And that's why we went out and we when we hired a director of population health who has under her responsibilities diversity and inclusion. And 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 she is spending the majority of her time working with community groups to um, community groups at risk, let me say, who need to have we think better access to our healthcare services. So we're we're trying to institutionally from our board education on down to our to our medical to our medical leadership and administrative leadership. Um, yet our our organization very focused on the need to provide additional services here. Um, you know we don't allocate the, the time of those forty five people is is absorbed by our institution so we don't you won't see a, a budget line for that group um we just incur those expenses and we we give them time to work on this issue but we are um spending real you know direct dollars on it on additional staff education all new employees go through diversity um and inclusion type education um we are also now doing training for various departments we have lunchtime lectures for departments that help educate them on it. And um, so I, I think, you know, we are we are moving in this direction. There's more work to be done. But I think we're making some real progress. And um, and we, certainly we understand uh, from a, a governance standpoint on down is that we have to be more actively engaged. And I think we're doing that. OK, thank you. You you managed to cover a few of my topics and I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll let it go given the time pressure. Um, I have one, uh, get it open. I have, uh, I've, I've spent a little bit of time looking at, I think this is a question for Steve, spent a little time looking at your bad debt and free care numbers through um, 19 and 20 actual and 21 uh, projected. Obviously this question is in the context of the pandemic. Um, everything's been turned on its head and, and so, your numbers actually sort of bump along um, relatively flat from 19 to 20 actuals, um, which makes you an outlier. Most every hospital had a, uh, a reduction in free care in 20 compared to 19. Um, so that's a good thing, though, um, though I would say at the end of the day, you know, your, your projected your projected 21 bad debt of 7 million and your projected 21 free care of 2.5 million. Um, um, I guess I want to ask you to comment on on that and I, I'd love to ask you to comment on both uh, what happened on the ground through the pandemic in terms of um, being able to make the programs available to people and um, and how you feel about where your numbers are landing at the moment. I think you're muted, Steve. There, there hasn't, um, you know, the, the, the team that works um, for the outreach and working with um, the uh, individuals um, on the charity care have been very active and we we took some measures where we didn't do face to face um, uh, interviews you know we worked uh, with um, uh, a, a lot of people and made some phone calls you know and set up meetings and and they just keep they just keep trudging along and, and working um, the the one comment that um, I did get, which was sort of a negative in preparation for this uh, question, uh, was there There are people that feel, um, they use the word entitled, um, when in fact they, they don't meet the criteria. So the team said, you know, maybe we need to look at our criteria a little more. Um, so, um, so that, as a result of your question, when I asked them that, they said, you know, we, 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 we got to look at our policy and look at our criteria a little, a little closer. Because there are people that are pushing that says, listen, you know, I, 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 need, I need charity care. I was told I can get charity care. And, but when they give us all the paperwork and all the information, they don't qualify for charity care. So we put them on payment schedules. 
And, um, you know, as for bad debt, um, you know, our, our numbers really haven't changed much, but we've been very flexible with a lot of people. And we, and if it's COVID related, we don't write it off to bad debt. We write it off to COVID allowances. OK, um, because you can't go after people for certain services. Uh, and then we've also we've also tapped into the HRSA website a lot. OK, um, to get reimbursed from the federal government. So I think I think the real the real um, measurement, Mike, will be post pandemic. Mm -hmm. What happens after? OK, and, and what happens to the numbers and, and, and the process after the pandemic? Because we're, we're, we're just trying to adjust every day on our feet. And um, so um, I don't know if that answers your question, but th that's the answer I got. You know, they're, they're scratching their head. And, and they, the only thing that they said was they feel that people feel more entitled. Um, I just a uh, clarifying question. Did you just say that there is a another category of uncompensated care besides bad debt and free care of a of a COVID allotment or? No, no. What, what, what I what I said was we're we're tapping in and maybe I didn't articulate it uh, well when when it's covid related okay mm -hmm. we are we are filing with the um the hrsa uh, because for for vaccines for testing you know if th th there's there's a fund out there that yep. you can you can you can file so um so things get written off to that and then if we get reimbursed we get reimbursed if we don't we don't yeah, if, it's, if it's if it's COVID related. OK, thank you. Okay. Yep. Just for a thank point, you. Steve, and I'm sorry, if, if you are working on revising your policies and the materials, we put it on hold because of the pandemic, but we've worked out some templates with MVRH and UVMMC, and so we have a lot of plain language material and best practices already developed. So I think when you get around to that, presume, you know, sometime in the future after this current surge, um, please reach out because I think um, hopefully we can save a create patient friendly policies and save your staff a fair amount of time. Sure. Thank you, Eric. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And you're muted. Kevin, you're muted. So <laughs> at this point, I'm going to open it up to public comment. And uh, is there anyone who wishes to offer public comment on the SVMC budget? Hearing none. Um, just a couple of administrative matters. First of all, thank you very much to everyone from SBMC. You're always very thorough and uh, thank you. Um, Kevin, I did Ham has his hand up. Okay, Ham. Thank you, Kevin. The, uh, my question really gets to the, uh, really into the area of healthcare reform. And I think that and I want to follow up a little bit on the questions by Jessica. Um, the whole issue of reform basically is to try and shift, uh, shift uh, reimbursement to uh, what I call fixed price contracts and whatever buzzword you want to use to do the same thing. Um, the, in your presentation, you have a table, a useful, useful table that shows that there shows that the amount of money I think that you uh, are involved with, with uh, uh, prospective reimbursement from three different payers, Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance. My question is this, the, the, I think that both private insurance and Medicare uh, do prospective payments, but they then, re, then, then they completely um, use shadow fee-for-service to reconcile at the end, which seems to me, but this is, we'll make this a question, doesn't that, we, the, the, the uh, reconciliation reduce the the, uh, the, the, the intended incentive against overuse and whether there's overuse or not can be argued about a lot. But my, my figures show that instead of uh, 
24%, which I think is what you come up with for, for uh, at-risk contracts um, with, with, um, with uh, one care. I come up with just Medicaid, if it's just Medicaid, which is the only real risk, the only real risk payer, then what I get is 5.1%. And if you, and even that, half of that has to be allocated to out-of-state providers. So that I get you really at, at not much more than just over 2%. Can somebody address that question? Because I think it's important. Thank you. I, I, I didn't follow the numbers. Um, currently, we get reimbursed, you know, in our budget, we submitted $42 million. Uh, the Medicare program uh, is $27 million. Um, that program, yes, it is reconciled back to fee-for-service from a cash flows perspective, but then um, it is measured against what our initial goals were going into the program. So that's $27 million. Um, on the Blue Cross, um, as, you, as you correctly stated, the Medicaid is, is roughly 10 million bucks, and that would be roughly, you know, is $10 million divided by 177. Um, that's about 5% uh, of, our net, of our total revenues. And then the Blue Cross is, is, is another 5.2. That's the um, uh, qualified health plan. So um, there's upside, downside to all of them. Um, we could probably spend hours going through the mechanics of the risk components. And, and there are corridors um, that, um, that are added to this, but um, without getting into real details and spending a lot of time, um, you know, I, I do believe that we're at risk. Uh, there's 42 million in our budget, and the corridors, you know, for for Medicare, um, they have been as high as four to five percent on each side. So that does create significant risk uh, for for our organization. Well, this is a, thank you. This is a comment. You, I did. I think you if you did it quickly and slowly, you wouldn't get five percent. You get five point one percent. But that's the real number. All none, there's no actual risk to you, to your revenue stream from either Medicare or Blue Cross. Thank you. Okay, Dale Hackett and uh, brevity would be appreciated. I've just learned from the uh, court reporters that uh, there's a hard stop of one. We're already behind schedule. We have another hospital left to go. We'll have to shorten the bio break. Um, Dale, fire away. I will be very quick. I've been in and out, so I may have missed what was presented. I want to know about the risk you are experiencing within the workforce issues itself in terms of burnout. Um, the, to make it very quick, do you know where I'm going and can you address that? Trey, you want to handle that one? Sure. I think first off, Dale, it, it's definitely um, awareness and attention towards uh, people's wellness and well-being. And we are definitely doing our best. I, I think many organizations are uh, recognizing that addressing this head on is key to keeping uh, the organization moving forward. Um, we do that both through verbal recognition, but we also um, are really main maintaining their vacations and ensuring that they are taking those vacations um, and taking a specific time for themselves. It's a real issue for sure. And I'm glad you I'm glad you asked that question. Thank you. Great. So I don't see any other hands raised. So at this time, I want to thank SVMC. We are going to take a quick bio break. We will be back on at 1120 with Brattleboro. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>